How to Win Friends, Influence People by Sparrowette Diamond Diamonds were the hardest known material in the world only a diamond could scratch another diamond. Yet diamonds were born from carbon, soft and easily burned coal, useful in its own way, yet much inferior. Diamonds were born when carbon was placed under great pressure and heat in the heart of the earth, burned to last and shine. Only under the harshest conditions could shinobi reach their true potential, like coal. Sai was among the lucky few. Sai saw the green glow of a scalpel made of chakra and his world went dark. He knew enough of chakra scalpels that he was very surprised when he realized he had woken up. Someone had carried the tatami mats outside and dried the wooden floor the best they could, but the house still appeared a bit shabby and charred around the edges. He was even more surprised to realize that he was unrestrained and that the Uchiha who was glaring at him near a wooden crate that had replaced the broken table had his hands tied. Yet Kabuto was free and he stood next to Uzumaki, though Ono stood behind him and had her hand on the handle of her sword. Sai was suffering from conflicting signals, which was never good when one was carrying a small armory's worth of knives. Were you attempting to engage in a tantric sex ritual with Uchiha earlier? He asked Uzumaki. Uzumaki's face turned bright red and he jumped at Sai with his fingers spread out like claws. An unknown long-nosed man in blue clothes caught Uzumaki by the back of his jumpsuit, but this didn't prevent the Uchiha from delivering a kick to his chest and attempting to strangle Sai with his legs. It wasn't a bad attempt, really, but a kick to the larynx would have been a much more effective way to end his life. Obviously Orochimaru's training had been subpar so far. It seems you are the one he spread his legs for, an unknown girl sputtered and now Uchiha turned towards her in the man's grip, his whole body language broadcasting barely restrained aggression that Sai attributed to the detrimental effect of the curse seal. But Uzumaki appeared to forget his burst of irrational rage caused by QB, maybe? And snorted with the girl. So I'm Uzumaki Naruto, though I'm called Sata Naruto here so you better use that name too, Uzumaki told him and extended his hand. These are Tsubaki-chan, she's my backup here and a really cool and strong Jounin Kanatsu-chan and Kid. they ran away from Kiri when their jerk-ass teachers told them to kill each other to graduate. They are a sister and a brother, you know. He's Taiki, he came after them, but we made him see the light so he stayed as well, and Kabuto used to be my friend and he came back to join my cult that I didn't ask for and didn't try to found. And Sasuke's still being stupid about things so he gets to be tied up. Uzumaki pointed at each and every person as he introduced them and thrust his hand out again. Sai stared at it and lifted his gaze to Uzumaki's face. You are supposed to take it, Uzumaki said with strangely lilting rhythm. Sai did as he was told and Uzumaki shook their entwined hands up and down a few times. Now you are supposed to tell me your name, the Jinchuriki continued his instructions. My name is Sai. Are these manners common amongst people or only those who belong in cults? He asked since Uzumaki seemed open to explaining the social convention he was following. It was very helpful of him, really. Are we sure this cult is a good idea on top of everything else? Ono asked, displaying exasperation. She was leaning against the wall with one hand now that Yakushi was taking a few steps to the side, away from Uzumaki yet towards Sai at the same time, and he found himself re-evaluating his initial assumptions concerning her loyalties. If she displayed aggression towards Orochimaru's underlings and protectiveness towards Uzumaki, did she remain faithful to Kanoha? Or the as-of-yet unnamed cult? Or rather, as she didn't seem to have a high opinion of said cult, to Uzumaki personally? He had been ordered to eliminate Ono if she turned out to be a threat, but so far the evidence was self-conflicting. He needed more information to reach a conclusion. And Yakushi Kabuto was to be killed. He knew far too much to be allowed to live but Sai was keenly aware after their brief fight, which he had only survived on Uzumaki's orders, that he wasn't a match in fair fight to the former Otonin. But there was more than one way to defeat an enemy. What is this cult? May I join it too? He asked. He had read an article about cult psychology and he was fairly certain that if he could get these people's trust as one of their own they would never expect betrayal of him. He was ready to go along with Uzumaki's manipulation for now, he had no problems being isolated from the civilian society. Besides, one of the major threshold that needed to be crossed when initiating new members into a cult involved physical hardship. This could include sleep deprivation, chronic hunger, long hours of manual labor or other similar things Sai figured that getting beaten in a fight should suffice. He was obviously prime cult material. 
Ah, maybe you will. I have seen eyes like yours before, Sai, Yakushi drawled. Sai looked into the man's dark eyes. Then he couldn't look away. He had once read that eyes were like water's cool surface underground, that it was romantic foolishness to try and seek the difference between an enemy and a lover within those depths. He knew that the expressions that were attributed to eyes were in fact formed by the muscles around the eyes and eyebrows. He had read this. I have seen eyes like yours before, sigh too often in the mirror. Did you have a name before Danza sent you here, or did you merely have a number? Who had to die so you had no one to define yourself by, nothing left but memories, a little less bitter every year? Kabuto's eyes were dark, but they seemed to hold a gravity seal that narrowed Sai's perception to those eyes and nothing else. Don't he started, but realized he had no idea what he was pleading Yakushi not to do. He was certain that if Root's files of Uzumaki Naruto were even marginally true, the Jinchuriki wouldn't allow him to be tortured. May I be alone with him for a little while, Naruto-sama? We could share our experiences and life lessons under Danzo, Yakushi asked. Sai could see nothing but his eyes. Sai had been carefully conditioned to not feel fear, but now he wondered if the small niggling at the back of his mind meant that he was scared. Only a diamond could scratch another diamond, but here, Sai thought, might be a diamond harder than he was. Club Seeing Sasuke again after all these months was strange and Naruto wasn't quite sure what to think or feel. Anger, yes, there was some of that. Actually, there was a whole a lot of it what had that idiot been thinking, leaving him and Sakura-chan behind and running off to the snake freak, making Sakura-chan cry? Okay, he could see that Sasuke had wanted to be strong to beat Itachi and all, but true strength didn't come from a curse seal that twisted your body until creepy missing Neen could possess you, and bye-bye to your vengeance then. Real strength was knowing that your friends gave you a reason to keep fighting and they were going to fight for you to help you reach your goals, even if the goal was a homicidal maniac missing Neen. Even if Sasuke was complete idiot he should have gotten this at least. So yeah, Naruto was angry. Sakura-chan had cried. But he was also giddy with relief. Sasuke was still Sasuke, still the one in charge of his own body, not just Orochimaru's new fashionable body. Sasuke was paler now, like he hadn't seen the sun for a good long time, his hair was a little longer like he hadn't bothered to cut it, his sleeves were a little too short like he hadn't bothered to get bigger clothes and Naruto was kind of surprised that his quest for vengeance hadn't made him forgot to bathe. Okay, maybe that was a teeny, tiny overstatement, but Sasuke should have taken better care of himself. Still, he was Sasuke and no one else. Can I trust you to not run or do I have to keep you tied up? He asked his errant teammate. He was pretty sure that Taiki and Kabuto could catch Sasuke before he left Makamura's borders anyway, but that didn't mean he wanted to bother them like that. He didn't want Sasuke to run. And he had to worry about Kabuto and Danzo and Sai and Orochimaru too. At least becoming Hokage should be a cakewalk after this kerfuffle. Was he the only person with a whole brain in the whole continent that he had to take care of everything? I can't become strong enough to beat Itachi and Kanoha, Sasuke complained in a dark tone, and struggled against his ropes. Naruto was pretty sure that Sasuke knew it was futile too and he was just being ornery like that. So he had an idiot, and a clue club to hit the idiot over the head with. He was good at hitting things at least. Look, you idiot, Itachi became strong enough to kill your clan in Kanoha. Orochimaru became strong in Kanoha and so did Kabuto okay, bad example since I'm gonna give that Danzo bastard his just desserts and how. Of course Naruto had known that the world was full of evil people and they weren't always going to be on the other side, but Danzo had still costed him something, some belief in his fellow humans. He had cost Kabuto and apparently Sai as well a lot more and he was going to collect that money's worth. Just wait, Danzo, the great Uzumaki Naruto was on to you. I've been in Kanoha this whole time. Do you think I'm weak? He shouted. Okay, so he hadn't been in Kanoha, technically speaking, but he had been a Kanoha Nin the whole time so it still counted. I'm not an idiot, you moron, Sasuke snapped at him and his Sharingan swirled in a mess of red and black that was hard to track. You've been cheating this whole time. I know about QB just a month ago this would have made Naruto shout in anger, but now he just snorted and shook his head. He knew he was better than that now. Hey, Avenger Chan, which one of us agreed to be turned into a monster? And if you think QB helped any, have you seen my academy grades? He asked and took a deep breath. He kind of wanted to get mad, but he knew it wouldn't help any. 
Look, I'm going to go back to Kanoha to ambush Danzo before he can figure out Kabuto's with us again and Sai's gonna be too, and after that we'll go after Orochimaru before he figures it out. If you can live through that you are going to be one kick-ass shinobi and I bet they have a lot of cool jutsu scrolls too. And if Kabuto taught you in Odo he can teach you in Kanoha too, he bribed Sasuke. There was no way he was going to let Sasuke team die, but he didn't have to say that, now did he? It was pretty obvious as far as bribery went, but hey, the hammer hadn't worked so why not try the club? And the Sharingan swirled slower now. Clue club for the win. Spade. Tsubaki had interviewed Yakushi Kabuto carefully and thanks to Naruto's order to be honest she believed she had indeed received truthful answers they were certainly disturbing enough. If they were in fact concealing something more disturbing, she didn't believe the man should be able to even function anymore. My professional opinion, she said. Time to call a spade a spade. You are nuttier than a squirrel in a bag of crackers. I don't think I have ever heard that before, Kabuto said amusedly. Usually people just scream you are insane or you are crazy. Never for very long, though. His perfectly non-confrontational, matter-of-fact tone made Tsubaki grit her teeth. They were kneeling on the opposite sides of the table in the safe house, a pot of tea and two cups between them. The house was still a bit bare, but the new inhabitants had left their marks Naruto in form of potted plants Tsubaki in the form of new curtains, yellow in color and more importantly mesh enforced, it had been a bit of pain to explain to the weaver that yes, she wanted this roll of wire mesh sewed between two layers of fabric, but the security they offered had made the ordeal worth it. Kanatsu had left fluffy blue slippers by the door, and she could see through the window to the garden where Miwa was hanging the laundry to dry. Now Sai had decided to add some charring to the walls and they needed to paper over it, but that was neither here nor there. It was a lively place and pale, white-haired Kabuto looked even more ghost-like, lifeless, against this tapestry. At least he wasn't trying to look lively himself. Tsubaki could still remember how he used to smile. Maybe, just maybe this was an indicator that the whole mess wasn't about to blow up on their faces. It wasn't that he didn't have faith in Naruto Koen's ability to turn around a person's worldview and perceptions of reality he practically challenged reality on a weekly basis, or maybe these had just been exceptionally busy weeks, and shouted from the rooftops that reality could try to crush him all it wanted, he wasn't going to be the one to walk away broken. He had decided to rid the town where he was supposed to lie low from a Yakuza because it was the right thing to do and gotten Tsubaki to go along with the mad plan it had been so easy she was a bit embarrassed. He had decided that prostitution wasn't a complex social problem and a socio-economical issue that would just have to be tolerated, it was something easily fixable and people just liked to make things more difficult than they were. Two Kiri missing Neen asking for shelter? Good, let's just convert the hunter Neen as well. Tsubaki actually trusted Taiki quite a bit at this point maybe she needed to get her head checked, but she did. She could grudgingly swallow the idea of even Sasuke's kind of under duress reformation sometime in the future, but Kabuto? Granted, she didn't know him very well he had been there on the peripherals of her awareness, the eternal genin who just couldn't get a promotion, right until he turned out to be down in level and working for a man who made it to the Leafs list of top five most dangerous traitors ever, order of entry undecided. And those hopefully honest answers had decided her opinion Kabuto was brilliant, but it was the brilliance of a broken crystal. The prisms made rainbows in the sun, but they were still undeniably broken and only a fool would grab one without thick gloves. I don't trust you. I'm keeping an eye on you and if you so much as twitch in a suspicious way before we can get you to the Hokage's office or after your head will part company from the rest of you. Kabuto tilted his head with a move like a snake's, his eyes raking up and down her body, not salacious, but assessing. To tell the truth, she wasn't entirely sure she could carry out that threat but she was Jounin as well and with Taiki by her side they should manage for sure. Letting me know you don't trust me wasn't a very good move, you know? In the completely hypothetical possibility that I'm playing you. Kabuto's voice was still pleasantly nondescript like the topic of their conversation was weather or something else equally inane, but there was the most minuscule twitch at the left corner of his mouth. It was official now. The bastard was enjoying this. It isn't as though I could make you believe in my sudden faith in your sudden loyalty so let me make my point in peace, okay? Tsubaki glared at the silver-haired man inside, letting her shoulders slump and picking up a brown paper bag from the floor. It was an uncomfortable situation, true, but it was one she would just have to deal with for now. Here, take these. It's a tradition now, 
and let's call a spade a spade you are here and I can't be rid of you so welcome to the group. She thrust the paper bag to Kabuto's arms and watched him check it carefully for concealed seals before opening it carefully. The face he made when he saw what was inside was most likely the first uncalculated expression she had gotten out of him. Pumpkin bread? He asked and raised one sardonic eyebrow, but it couldn't quite cover the startled curve of his eyes. Kanatsu got a bit carried away. But you aren't getting the bombs, don't even bother asking. She didn't trust him, but she was willing to give Naruto his one chance to bring the man around. One chance to catch an even bigger monster, and who knew? Maybe even two. Water. Water was eternal, Taiki's first teacher had once told him, back in the academy. Boil it, it will rain back to earth sooner or later, freeze it and it will melt eventually, pour in on the ground and the plants will bring it back up to the air. To be a water ninja was to be mutable, adaptable, forever changing. He had forgotten this for a long time, as his whole village had. Maybe Kiri would be a better place if more people had listened to Yamadara Sensei. That he was being given a crash course in adaptability by a fire shinobi was irony that didn't escape him. You are just going to go to your Hokage with them in tow? Without even writing to her first? He asked with some difficulty. His gaze moved from Sai, who was staring at Kabuto in a manner that was both intrigued and vaguely horrified, to Kabuto, who was eating pumpkin bread and smiling like nothing was wrong in the world, to Sasuke, who was glaring at Naruto, but untied and not trying to escape. Of course. If I gave her advanced warning that Danzo Bastard would get warned as well. Don't worry, Tsunade Bachan is gonna do the right thing she ran away from Kanoha and gambled and drank all over the continent because she hated Kanoha getting people killed, how you think she's going to take the news about Danzo? Naruto asked back and munched on his ramen happily. You call her Bachan behind her back? Kanatsu asked with sardonic lilt in her voice, raising one eyebrow. Are you sure she will want to help you? I call her Bachan to her face. Don't you know how old she is? Naruto asked. All three former Kiri Nin choked in their own spit as they imagined what would happen in Kiri if anyone, absolutely anyone, was to call the Mizukage names. If Naruto really could get away with that and he was the most honest person Taiki had ever met just maybe the mad idea of ambushing the Hokage with this issue would work out. Tsubaki's hand had frozen in midair, her chopsticks holding a few leaks like they were a shield between her and the crazy world. She was muttering under her breath and Taiki caught the words technically true, kind of and what happened to the world I used to live in anyway he echoed the sentiment fully. Are you going to return here? Miwa asked, wringing her hem in hands. She was sitting next to Naruto as usual, with an abandoned pad and a pencil on the crate table in front of her. Her eyes were almost feverish when she looked at the boy under her lashes. Sure, I have responsibilities here and besides, Aero-sensei would have an apoplexy if he came here and I was missing, Naruto promised happily. Miwa brightened instantly, but Taiki remembered a certain gigantic sword-wielding toad, what that had to mean and opened his mouth again even though he wasn't really surprised anymore. You call Jiraiya of the Sanin Aero sensei behind his back? He asked. Irreverence, thy name is Naruto, he thought. Or possibly Uzumaki he had heard stories about the clan prior to the destruction of Yuzushiogakure. I call him Aero sensei to his face. You know he writes the Ika Ika, right? Naruto cheerfully destroyed yet another piece of reality. Now Taiki couldn't work his jaw open anymore and he wondered if he was slipping into disbelieving catatonia of some sort. The name Jiraiya was on the covers and there were rumors of of it being that Jiraiya, but there were always rumors. He hadn't really believed, had thought it propaganda by Kanoha's enemies, because how could the legendary I was his proofreader for a while and let me tell you, those books aren't all that great, Naruto confided in them. By the time Taiki's brain could process new information again it was decided that Kanatsu and Kid would remain in Makamura and further train the fire brigade, what with being dead and not in need of shelter, assisted by Idate. Miwa had promised to take responsibility for fixing the safe house up again and writing more mantras Naruto had tried to escape his cult leader status by pointing out that Shodame Hokage had fought QB first, which had only worked to encourage the girl as now he needed to be added to the saints too. And Rakuto Sanin for a good measure because what proper Jinchiriki cult didn't mention him? Adaptability, adaptability, adaptability hell, at this point he wouldn't have been surprised if Naruto's affinity happened to be water. Do you know what your elemental affinity is? He asked, giving the boy an assessing look. 
In Fire Country Fire was the most common, hence the name of the elemental country, but there were exceptions among the most ironic their first Hokage who had been earth and water. It's wind, Naruto said happily and now Taiki couldn't help but laugh. Of course, contrary to the very end. Fire. The town of Makamura didn't really know darkness until the final hours before the dawn. The promenade was still alight with the lights of the restaurants and bars where the tourists partied long past the midnight and the sounds of laughter and music filled the night. Couples walked the streets from one amusement to another or returning to their hotel, but none saw the shadow leaping quickly from one rooftop to another. Yakushi Kabuto had given his minder a slip and walked the night of Makamura. It was the last night before the group would leave for Kanoha and he was checking on Sasuke, as it wouldn't do for the Uchiha to get cold feet and attempt a last-minute escape. He was grateful they were leaving, to tell the truth. In Makamura Naruto-sama was in so high demand, between the starry eyes assistant and her constant demands he approved some of her writings, the head and girls and the casino boat manager, the nervous owner of the delicacy shop which had first offered Naruto-sama cover, the fire brigade leadership, said leadership's obsession with taking over the kitchen and making explosives hidden in fruits that the clone jutsu was rather necessary. Add to that keeping both Sasuke and Sai under control, guarded by vigilant Tsubaki and Taiki, and he barely had any time for Kabuto. They wouldn't be alone on the road to Kanoha, but four people were better than closer to twenty every day. The safe house was the old-fashioned type with one big room that served as living area, dining room and bedroom that Naruto-sama shared with his minions. It had obviously been a bit tight fit even before the arrival of Kabuto, his gift and the root shinobi, but expecting eight people, three of them under suspicion and guard, to sleep in the same room was simply impractical. Naruto-sama had appropriated Matsuzaki's storehouse for temporary lodgings which had led to arguments about the placing of the three guests. Tsubaki had insisted that Kabuto and Sasuke be separated lest they intrigue together, a sensible precaution in itself, but this had left the question of dividing the ninja to guard the three. Tsubaki and Taiki, the most capable of Naruto-sama's underlings, not counting Kabuto, couldn't share a guard, which had irritated the woman terribly. In the end Tsubaki had decided to watch Kabuto in the safehouse's storage room while Taiki was looking after Sasuke and Sai in the storehouse. Kabuto was glad a jounin had been given to Naruto-sama as a backup in a peaceful place like Makamura Kanoha was the only village populous enough to assign jounin so. He was less happy that fooling the woman with Jinjutsu had been so easy, though it worked for him now. Taiki was harder. While Tsubaki had been a solid jounin, good enough at everything, but exceptional at nothing, the man was a former Umbu member, from a subdivision that dealt with some of the most desperate people in the five countries. He didn't bother with Jinjutsu at all, but employed one of the Yamanaka family Jutsu and deepened the man's light sleep to deep unconsciousness. There was a small cot on the room set aside for Sasuke, in between a few crates. Kabuto was entirely unsurprised to find that the boy was walking a circle around the small floor space like a caged animal. On the other side of a higher wall of crates Sai wasn't asleep either, but Kabuto didn't mind the other listening in. He hadn't come to spare Sasuke's privacy. That is not a good idea, he stated, amused when the Uchiha turned sharply around, his face flushing in the dim light that reached the room through a small window near the ceiling. Sasuke had a long way to go before he reached his brother's level if he couldn't even control his own reactions. Kabuto knew how this conversation would go and he knew it would more than likely deal some psychological damage to Sasuke there were things the child wasn't ready to confront yet. But as long as he didn't leave without Naruto-sama's permission, Kabuto was fine with that. How he is so strong? Sasuke spat the question out. I can understand the cult they are just weak civilians. I can understand the two from Mist they never even made proper genin. But Taiki? You? What Naruto did to get you? Do you know what the will of fire is? Outsiders take it for Kanoha mysticism, philosophy and Kanoha lets them think what they will. In truth it is a chakra control technique. Not one I have ever managed I'm much too fragmented and this technique requires the user is sane. He knew he held Sasuke's full attention. The council's handprint was clearly visible on the boy. One so easily exploitable should never have been allowed outside the village's walls. But Danzo liked them broken, liked them easily owned and if Kabuto's only choice had been by whom, he had at least made a choice that didn't break him more, that bandaged him. That might even fix him one day. Chakra is half mental energy. The will of fire is to make your goal, your dream or a mission, into an inseparable part of yourself. 
to eat it and drink it, to breathe it, to make it your cloak and bed and to make it your blade and remain a whole person. It is a delicate balance to find, one which requires a great deal of maybe idealism is a wrong word. The person has to be wholesome enough that their goal doesn't destroy them. There were other focusing techniques that didn't have such harrowing requirements, of course, but Kabuto wasn't there for Sasuke's benefit. He didn't mention them. How come killing Itachi isn't wholesome enough? He is a traitor, a kinslayer. He's still a threat to everybody. Sasuke shouted. Really, such an uncontrolled boy. Even if Sai had been asleep earlier, now he couldn't possibly be. You didn't care about the threat he is, you want to stop hurting. There is nothing wrong with that now for the kill, when the throat was bared. But while you hate him, you love him also. You can't master enough focus with the divide inside you and this is why Naruto-sama has surpassed you. Within him there is only unity. The fault was in Sasuke, not in Konoha. And if the boy broke a little, Kabuto was certain that Naruto-sama could shore him up again. Now it was better to return before Naruto-sama's shift was up. Earth. Sandame Suchiki Janoki of both scales was an old man and age brought some privileges with it to balance the weakening, aching body and finding you had outlived pretty much everyone, friends, allies and enemies likewise. One of the privileges he had claimed was a small army of scribes who did his paperwork according to his orders. They were all former active duty jounin of his village, retired either due to age or injury, and he knew he could trust them implicitly. These days he only signed the papers with his own hand. This was important. Deep within the belly of the earth a sure hand had painted an old document white with correction fluid, taking special care with the nooks and crannies left around and inside the kanji of Anoki's name to make certain no difference in the color of the paper could be detected. Assassination of Morimoto Tomomi, B-Class Recipient Kakuzu General Information Morimoto Tomomi, Chunin, Register ID 015652, is to be considered a liability to the security of Awagakure no Sato due to the high level of emotional dependence of Tsuchikage candidate Deidara, Jounin, register ID 015611, on this individual. In broad terms codependency refers to the dependence on the needs of or control of another, often characterized by excessive compliance or control patterns. For further information on the decision-making criteria, consult file psychological assessments, Deidara, ID 015611. Minimum requirements Morimoto Tomomi is to die within three days of the acceptance of this mission by means that implicate a foreign village or a known missing Nin. Payment standard B class assassination payment, to be rendered after proof of death has been given. Due to the confidential nature of the mission, no receipt will be given. Signed Sandame Suchiki Janoki in the country of Earth, an explosive had been prepared and the fuse was slowly burning shorter and shorter. Wind. Naruto had arrived to tea country by land, but he left by sea. The sea sprite was a quick tourist ship that would take them from Makamura to a fire country city near the borderlands that separated them from water country's sphere of influence, cutting the curve of the tea country foreland. He had been on ships before, mostly during his short time as Jiraiya's apprentice, but it was still new enough that he ran to the ship's bow to meet the waves and the wind head on. It was a beautiful day and the whole world was blue and white sky and fluffy clouds above him the deep blue sea with white cap waves below him. The wind pushed his back like it had the strength to lift him up and Naruto spread his arms. One day I'm going to fly. He shouted over the wind and the waves to the presence behind him. It was a bit cold and the tourists were all huddled under the deck, leaving only the shinobi hiding among them to enjoy the space and the privacy. Be careful, Naruto-sama, Kabuto said and stepped beside him. For once Tsubaki-chan wasn't standing guard and Naruto wondered if his friend maybe used a clone to ditch her. He knew she meant well and was just worried about him and stuff, but it was really difficult to have conversations when she listened to everything neither Kabuto nor Sasuke nor apparently Sai were very open. Not one day, Kabuto said quietly and Naruto spun around to ask if he knew some really cool wind jutsu that made people fly, but Kabuto wasn't looking at him at all, but towards northeast. That was where Kanoha was, far, far beyond even the best-looking glass site. Not just one day when the plans have reached their completion, but three days from now. Ah, he was talking about Danzo. Yeah, don't leave to tomorrow what you can do today. Procrastination's a bad habit, he shared Irika Sensei's pearls of wisdom. Who knows how many people's lives he's ruining even now. The thought made him angry and a lick of fire ran over his chakra, but he pushed it back, frowning. 
Come to think of it, QB had been really active lately. What was up with the furball? Naruto-sama, I would advise you, Kabuto offered with the same kind of voice Naruto had used Ebisu and some other guys use when they talked to Sandame Gigi and now Tsunade Bachan, he guessed it was kind of insistent, but also really, he didn't know. Obedient like. Naruto's vocabulary had drastically improved since Jiraiya had taken him as a student, but the words subservient and deferential had yet to make it to his thesaurus. For all his griping Jiraiya actually preferred it that way. Sasuke is precious to you. Your village is precious to you this is true, right? He asked, and Naruto was going to answer of course, but Kabuto wasn't done yet. Then don't let Sasuke be there when we accost Danzo. In fact it might be better if you weren't there either. The smile he gave was sheepish, like the one he had given in the Chunin exams when he had admitted failing the exams how many times already. Naruto didn't like it, though back then he had felt intense kinship. Why not? And don't smile if you don't mean it, that's as almost as creepy as size, he complained, though Kabuto couldn't quite meet the same creepy levels with his smile alone at least he knew how his face worked and didn't look like he was contemplating axe murder. Am I your precious person, Naruto-sama? Kabuto asked, the smile disappearing. He had that intense look again, like when he had looked towards Konoha. Of course, Naruto said. It wasn't like went around befriending people for the sheer hell of it. He always meant business. Would you deceive me knowingly? Kabuto asked, his eyes doing this funny flutter that Naruto wasn't sure how to read. Of course not. He denied hotly. Trust me, please, Naruto-sama. You are better off not meeting Danzo. He can be very garrulous when it suits him. Naruto was briefly distracted by wondering what garrulous meant and then the moment was over, Tsubaki-chan walking towards him with sullen Sasuke in tow. Sasuke was pale like a ghost and his eyes had dark shadows, like he hadn't slept a wink last night. Okay, I guess. Sasuke's been really weird anyway, he promised. And Sai too. What you said to him anyway? He asked. Sai was in some strange sort of limbo he hadn't really renounced Danzo, but he wasn't protesting anything either. Actually, he was walking around looking like someone hit him over the head with a really big hammer. He was making frantically notes to his book with normal ink and giving Naruto some really funny stares. Maybe you should ask him. I'm certain he would welcome a private conversation with you, Naruto-sama, Kabuto said and then Tsubaki-chan and Sasuke were there, Sasuke avoiding his eyes for all he was worth. The wind was at their back, taking them closer and closer to Konoha. Spirit Many scholars theorized that the tailed beasts were personification of negative emotions, born out of the bad karma of the sinful humankind that Jubi had been the negativity undivided and that the Sage of Six Paths had broken it to its base components. They theorized that Kyubi was the personification of hate. It was complete rubbish, of course, but what else should be expected from the vicious ants? The only human worth anything had been their father and now Rakuto Sanin was too long millennia dead. It was true that Karama could sense negative emotions, a fact which hadn't made his current incarceration any more comfortable. He could actually feel a measure of sympathy towards Uzumaki Naruto. Unlike Uchiha Madara who had simply taken control of him, calling him a weapon, and unlike Senju Hashirama who had sealed him into his wife, unlike Uzumaki Mido who had helped her husband and chained him and unlike Uzumaki Kushina who had made an informed decision and accepted her duty as his prison, Naruto had been a baby whose opinion no one had been interested in. Kurama had simply been shoved into him, a little baby in post Kyubi Kanoha, and Naruto was almost as trapped as Kurama was. But at that point Kurama was fed up with the Jinchuriki and with the Jubi damned village the Uchiha and Senju had spawned, he'd had half of his chakra violently ripped away from him, his current Jinchuriki was the son of the man who had done it and the Shinigami's seal would see to it that if the little insect died with the seal still whole, he would die as well. What little sympathy Kurama felt for Naruto was by far overshadowed by his hate. No, he wasn't personification of hate, but he was living up to his reputation nicely. And just when he had thought it impossible, Naruto had come up with an entirely new and fascinating way to fan those flames. A Jinchuriki cult. A religion that beatified those reviled human cages, a religion that had first claimed Yandame Hokage as a saint and now claimed Rakuto Sanin as well. His father. He had always seized any kind of opportunity to gain control over Naruto, provoking his rage and so allowing his influence within his chakra to consume the boy, 
frustrated beyond measure that while humans were so very capable of rage, this one just wouldn't allow himself to fully give into it. Now he had redoubled his efforts, searching for the smallest opening, but there was new security in his own strength in Naruto, something that couldn't be called serenity, but that still kept anger at bay even when he fought the damnable Uchiha. Kurama threw himself against the gates of his prison and cursed Yandame Hokage and Shiki Fujin, cursed Yumino Iruka and Haku and Uchiha Sasuke. I'm not going to let you hurt Iruka anymore, you jerk. When a person has something important they want to protect, that's when they can become truly strong. I won't let you leave, even if I have to beat you within an inch of your life. Naruto had learned what shouldn't have been possible for him to ever know, but Kurama wasn't beaten yet. This was one religious debate he was going to win even if it was the death of them both. Breakfast Mijua wasn't the biggest city Naruto had ever seen, but even from the deck of the ship that had taken his group to the city it appeared easily the most colorful and lively. The fire country capital was bigger, but it had been an awfully stuffy place temples with ornamental tower pavilions and kidney-shaped ponds and houses with pillars and decorated roofs. That one city in water country had been even bigger, but there had been slums and it had been a pretty sad-looking place, like a wet puppy that gave you pitiful look so you would take it in from the rain and feed it. Mijawa had banderols and signboards in bright red, deep blue and some really eye-grabbing neon colors, busy-looking streets with roofs so near each other he would barely have to hop from one to the other and a huge fish market next to the harbor. It was a homely-looking city and Naruto loved it on sight. Too bad they couldn't stay for a day or two, but busy busy. Danzo couldn't wait. La la la, come morning, come day, I wish in me hard it was Sunday, Naruto sung as he marched down the landing plank to the wharf, clutching his shirt over his heart. Miso for breakfast all week long, and sweet ramen on a Sunday. The ship had only offered traditional breakfast, sadly enough, but here they could surely buy some ramen. I thought it was supposed to be sake, dobe, Sasuke grumbled as he stepped after Naruto. Naruto shook his head. No way, I'm much too young to drink. They didn't let you do that in Odo, did they? Because it's really bad for your liver, you know he asked, worried. It would be just like Orochimaru to be even more irresponsible responsible adult than Aero-sensei was. Don't be stupid. Of course I didn't. There is nothing wrong with my liver, Sasuke barked, his face red. Sai tilted his head and looked confused, but then, he rarely looked anything else. What if I like miso better? He asked. Naruto hung his head sadly over his heathen tastes, but then, more for him. Then we can steal each other's breakfast all the week, it works out in the end, he said. Sai took out his book again and started trying to rhyme that without much success, but Naruto noticed how he didn't walk into anything or anyone even though his face was in the book. He was so going to demand Aero sensei taught him to do that once he returned, it would be so cool. Except maybe he didn't have to wait, Tsubaki-chan probably knew the trick too someone said something good-natured and polite to Tsubaki as they walked down the street, something about having two so cute sons, and then asked if the two pale-haired were her nephews or cousins. Naruto wasn't really listening to the small talk since his eyes were roving the streets for ramen stands, but then Sasuke stiffened suddenly. You, he hissed to Naruto and clutched his neck over the seal that stuck out from the pale skin, so bright and angry. I think she would rather claim you. You are wholesome. It came so out of nowhere that Naruto stumbled over his two feet as he turned to look at Sasuke. Air, thanks. What? He asked, but Sasuke turned his face away. How being wholesome works? Sai asked, and while Naruto had already learned that his questions tended to be weird with the side order of inappropriate, this was getting suspicious. Rice and miso for breakfast with a side dish of shared angst. There was something bugging Sasuke and Sai and he was going to get to the bottom of it. Lunch. So you protect the roots of the tree. What have you done that protects Kanoha? I have killed Kanoha's enemies. You believe that makes you necessary? Even Green Genin can kill for Kanoha. Sai was running at steady pace, behind Sasuke and before Taiki. They were traveling an old gravel road between gently sloping hillsides, dotted only by a few wooden houses and shallow streams, towards a green line at the horizon. Once they reached Kanoha's security zone he should escape and haste to warn Danzo-sama. Or should he? Sai wasn't used to feeling unsure of his duty. His duty was to obey, but to obey whom? He was most uncomfortable operating with conflicting, incomplete intel. 
Tsubaki had taken place in front of Sasuke, Kabuto by her right side and Uzumaki Naruto had taken the point. Tsubaki was Naruto's superior probably. She was a Jounin and Naruto only a Genin, but she had been sent as backup, to assist. She deferred to Naruto's judgment regarding Kabuto, Sasuke and Sai himself, even though she reserved the right to voice her doubts. The unclear chain of command was a risk in the field and she should have known better, yet she made the situation appear easy to manage. Adaptable, the Kiri defector had called her disposition and mumbled something about water elemental chakra, though Sai was certain she was fire type. Kabuto turned his head, easily defecting the general focus of Sai's attention. He wasn't certain of the exact limits of the man's capabilities at this time, but it was clear that the traitor was easily superior in skill and power to Sai, maybe all of them with possible exception made for Naruto and Taiki the Jinchuriki's reported power levels fluctuated too much to get a proper estimate and he didn't know the extent of Taiki's skills. Why don't you talk to him? Kabuto asked and the questioning cant in his voice forced Sai to forcibly relax his shoulders, to resist a grimace. He had been conditioned to not respond to the animal impulse to flinch after suffering physical damage, yet that tone made him want to argue even when there was nothing to argue against. I am a tool to protect Kanoha. You have nothing else to say? Then again, capacity to reason isn't in high demand in Root, now is it? Sandame disbanded Root, Sai. He decided that to strip humanity from Kanoha is to strip Kanoha from Kanoha. So what are you protecting? Naruto, he called the Jinchuriki's name, lengthening his stride while Naruto turned his head and grinned. That ever-present happiness didn't fail to take Saya back again. The Jinchuriki made the best high-danger assassins, not to mention the high-destruction ones, yet he couldn't imagine Naruto serving in that capacity. Yeah. What is it? Naruto asked, jumping over a small tree that had fallen across the road, then grabbing a branch and throwing the trunk to the side of the road with ease. There, now it isn't going to bother people. His rhythm had barely broken at all. Sai wondered why he had bothered. You are wholesome Sai begun, making Naruto groan. He didn't let that stop himself. Are you still useful to Kanoha? He asked. Naruto cocked his head to the side and snorted. Obviously. I'm totally devastating, like those orange, poisonous toads, they are cool and so is their jutsu he boasted and Sai remembered that in nature the brightest colored animals were the most dangerous. He looked at mild and mellow Kabuto, Kabuto who called him Naruto-sama, and Sasuke who glared daggers at him, but didn't object, surprisingly. Just few days ago he would have sworn that those two would only return to Kanoha in chains or body bags. When an enemy was enemy no longer, wasn't the enemy dead then? Even if the person wasn't? Vision that doesn't make you happy, doesn't make you productive member of the village, or even some hat proficient in anything more subtle than outright slaughter. Vision that Kanoha has rejected once already. Vision of Danzo if you haven't got it in you to be angry for being used, are you angry then for being wasted? I don't know what wholesome issues you have got here, but real ninja aren't controlling jerks. I guarantee you, the ones going on and on about people being tools are the biggest hypocrites. Just look at Zabuza, he said he wanted to overthrow the Mizukage because he was a tyrant and then he became an enforcer for another tyrant for rebellion money. Seriously, what the hell? Naruto asked, lifting his face upwards as if to ask intervention from some higher being, but then his features softened, gentled. At least he regretted in the end trying to have the last word with Naruto is like having a lunch with a tiger. The food may be good, but the tiger always eats the last. Dinner Naruto wasn't a vicious person by nature, but he was occasionally willing to make an exception. The Yakuza of Makamura could have testified to that. It was like a joke two wolves and a saber-toothed sheep walked into a diner they had covered a good distance already when the oppressive, dark clouds started to gather in the sky. It wasn't quite dark yet and they could have gone a while longer when they happened upon an old barn, half filled with hay, but Tsubaki-chan decreed they should stop and Naruto was all too happy to do so as he wasn't too keen on sleeping under a tree in rain. Sai was muttering something about confused chain of command, but he decided that Sasuke and his issues were enough to bite that night and ignored it. Sasuke, who walked into a nearby kind of forest except too small to brood and didn't come back when the rain started. Right. Figures. So Naruto went after him because if Sasuke happened to be wet, well, it was his problem, not a reason to delay the talk. He found his dark, brooding teammate standing under a buna tree, 
hanging his head and slouching. Naruto wasn't precisely cold, but water was running down his neck and back and he was feeling pretty dark himself when he jumped under the cover of the leaves. Then he looked at Sasuke closer. So nice weather? He tried and pressed against the tree. It protected him from some of the rain, but it was a plant, not an umbrella. H.N. Sasuke was dripping even more than Naruto was, but he still managed to look scornful. Naruto blushed and bristled. So it was a dumb thing to say, yeah, didn't Sasuke already know that the filter between his brain and mouth was kinda faulty? Look, I'm trying to have a conversation here. And you are the one too dumb to come in from the rain. Asshole. Naruto kicked a patch of grass that hadn't ever done a thing to him. Things weren't this awkward before he didn't even know why he got all shy and nervous all of a sudden. It wasn't like Sasuke was going to run away again, right? Asshole? Is that the best you can come up with? The jerk asked and all bashfulness evaporated in a second. So that was how he wanted to play it? Fine then, Naruto could deliver. Bootlegger. Nitwit bastard of a freshwater pirate and a scabby mule with the brains of an oyster with shits that was dropped on its head as a baby. What? Sasuke mouthed after a good, long pause. Naruto grinned as he watched Sasuke's befuddled face. Hey, he didn't get to see the ice prince drop his jaw every day. Jiraiya sensei spends a lot of time at red light districts. Lots and lots of time. Naruto nodded sagely. He had learned that once you edited out all the mentions of between legs body parts and sex acts, those people had some fun curses. He had also learned well over 50 words for female parts, roughly half of them something he didn't even want to think too loud for the fear Tsubaki-chan might hear and half so convoluted that walking past a fruit stand or a flower shop or, or a fishwife stand could make Sakura-chan blush if she read some of that poetry shit the geisha liked so much. A few hundred years ago people had so many words for the female parts that it was really hard to have a conversation about anything without inadvertently mentioning at least two of them. Seriously, who makes a temple synonym for a geisha house and purse for, well, that part? So you say I'm one of your precious people and chase after me, Sasuke begun he didn't quite unbend enough to make quotation marks with his fingers, but Naruto could hear them in his voice loud and clear. What if I say I can't stop El caring for my brother? His voice dripped snide all over the place, more than the tree dripped water. That bastard, Naruto grumbled and again the red-hot otherness inside him licked his chakra like a hungry dog. He kicked it down firmly. Sasuke was an idiot and a bastard, but he needed him now, no time for stupid personal theatrics. You don't think I'm disgusting? Sasuke asked. He was still trying to sound cold and mean, but not quite pulling it off. It was dark, the sun low and behind thick, dark clouds, and Naruto didn't see Sasuke's face all that well, but the way his errant teammate hunched his shoulders made Naruto want to hug Sasuke. He thought better about it since Sasuke would only punch him. Then he did it anyway. What the stop it, you idiot? Sasuke did punch him, but it was a weak, feeble thing and Naruto could hear a small, quiet sob. The red was back then, a thick, suffocating blanket over him as he imagined tearing Itachi's heart from his chest with his bare fingers and blood everywhere, red, red, red. He couldn't remember how he pushed the red back this time, but when he came back to his senses, they were both dry and the raindrops falling on his skin were sizzling. Naruto wasn't a vicious person by nature. Iruka sensei had once long ago told him that a real agreement was something more than two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner. Naruto had agreed then, imagining the sheep in orange color having only seen black and white pictures of the creatures and hey, his woolen clothes were orange and feeling a lot of sympathy for the poor creature. Sasuke was wide-eyed and looked a little scared so Naruto hugged him again and this was where the simile came crashing down because he thought of Itachi. The mental picture of woolly, bloody saber-tooth, sheep Itachi was fairly ridiculous because it was so devastatingly cute. Bah, bah, sheep Itachi bleated and fluttered its red swirly eyes inside Naruto's head. He smirked. He was hungry, he was going to have a dinner and he was going to invite Sasuke because he was generous like that. Aero-sensei was kind of lazy and a pervert, but he was good and Naruto was going to train and if Itachi didn't want to get eaten, well, too bad. It was up to a vote and it was two against one now. Food. Evil wasn't a word that Tsubaki wanted to throw around lightly she was a killer for hire after all. But she remembered the Kyuubi's attack and she was confident in calling that creature evil, its chakra terrifying in its raw killing intent. 
It was overwhelming, it was malicious, it had been thick in the air like the smell of blood and smoke from the burning buildings and every breath she had taken had been a battle against freezing in terror. Now she stood in the rain and watched his charge hugging the Uchiha. Terrible anger was radiating off the boy, bringing back scorching memories with it, but Naruto was even in his anger infinitely gentle. I think we should leave, she said, her tongue turning clumsily in her mouth as she turned her back to the picture. This gave some food for thought. Literally, almost. She thought of Naruto's precious Iruka sensei Iruka-sensei said this, Iruka-sensei did that, always Iruka-sensei first to the extent that mentions of Kakashi-sensei and Aero-sensei sometimes seemed almost afterthoughts. She thought of Naruto's precious ramen, how the boy could scarf even the tasteless instant kind down bowl after bowl. A bowl of vegetables served with love is better than a three-course meal served with hatred, she remembered the old proverb. Not that Naruto ever failed to complain about vegetables, but he ate them all the same because Iruka sensei had told him they were an important part of a shinobi's diet and Iruka sensei was never wrong. Shouldn't we keep guard in case he loses control of the biju? Sai asked, a black and white shadow in the dark. Kabuto's hand moved just a little bit closer to something that was in all likelihood sharp and pointy and Tsubaki found much to her horror that right now, just for that, she approved of the man. They were huddling in the rain just far enough that the two genin shouldn't notice them as long as they didn't start shouting. Taiki managed to stay dry somehow, deflecting the raindrops so his hair and clothes were just a bit damp. Kabuto wasn't dry, gratifyingly enough, but he managed to look very dignified and regal even when he looked like someone had thrown him overboard on their way over the gulf. Sai looked like someone might have thrown him to the sea and he wouldn't have cared, making Tsubaki wonder if she was in need of some remedial weather desensitization training. She was cold and the water was running down her back and even her underwear was damp by now, chafing as she moved. Let's go back, she said and started shepherding her group back towards the barn. No one is losing control here, no sense in getting even more wet than we already are. But how? Taiki asked, walking slowly, turning his head to look over where the two boys disappeared into the shadows of the trees and the rain. How can he feel like, like that and not do anything? Tsubaki smiles as she recalled the day she had taken this mission, how she and Irika had eaten at Ichiraku's, the warm sun and the rich taste of the broth and the misery she had now left behind. There are two men in Kanoha. One of them is an academy teacher, the other is a ramen chef and when we return I'm going to kiss them both. And if there was still a hint of Kyubi against the backdrop of the forest, the bite of it felt almost safe, like the canned wasabi beans that had been her comfort food since she was ten years old. Drink. The first time Deidara met Morimoto Tomomi he didn't think much of her. She was two years older than he was, yet they graduated the same year and when she took her chunin exams he stood in front of a panel that reviewed his jounin evaluation scores. She didn't have many prospects of ever becoming a jounin either, though of course she wasn't a bad kunoichi. She was dependable, the sort whose dedication to her village was beyond question, who was good on missions and didn't bring her drama to the battlefield she wasn't the type to have any personal drama, period. She was supportive of her friends and comrades and an all-over nice person. She was pretty in the girl next door kind of way. She wasn't the type to catch a young genius eye. She was one of the two chunin assigned to Daidara on his second mission as a jounin. That mission was an unmitigated disaster the information given to them had been inaccurate. Instead of four Kiri missing Nin trying to form a drug ring there had been fifteen from Kiri, Kumo and Aim, three of them jounin level. The Chunin named Yasu died in combat and Deidara and Tomomi were taken prisoner, to be tortured for high-price information. As Deidara was the one in possession of more classified information and he was presumably the tough one as well, the missing Nin decided to soften him before working him over. Sleep deprivation, they decided, some beatings and of course the psychological torture of watching his comrade being tortured and breaking before his eyes. Tomomi didn't break on day one and she didn't break on day two. On day three they drugged her water, and while she tasted what had been done to it, the foul drink was forced down her throat. We want dirt, little Kunoichi, dirt on your precious village. Have you ever been part of a political assassination, an androgynous man the others called Osamu asked Tomomi after her eyes crossed though Deidara wasn't perfectly certain he wasn't in fact a she. Assassus Tomomi tried to pronounce the word, sounding confused. Kill, Osamu corrected himself with a disgusted tone. Bound and gagged, Deidara could only listen in helplessly. There is a thing about prodigies and geniuses in the ninja world, 
something that might make being one not worth the cost they have this disconnect from their peers, never quite understanding the why and how of other people because they are so different, though some hide this better than others. They also tend to be fragile in ways that aren't always outward obvious. That day Daydara wallowed in the dishonor of his failure, something he hadn't ever known before, not even contemplating escape because he was too busy contemplating suicide. Kill, Tomomi sniffled. My poor I had red and orange and that white sort with the violet thing at the center, you know. Zinnias. You killed your potted plant? Osamu uttered flatly, clearly unimpressed with this confession. I didn't mean to. Tomomi defended herself brokenly. Even with the gag it had to be obvious at this point that Daydara was gaping. They were so happy flowers maybe. It's kinda difficult to tell with plants. And then there were my forget-me-nots. I sort of forgot to water them before I left for a mission. When I finally returned they were dead too Tomomi went on and on and on about her inability to keep her flowers alive, telling of the gardenias and the lavenders and the red spider lilies. When she got to the bonsai tree some optimistic fool had given to her as a birthday present, Osamu was the one who snapped and delivered her a harsh slap. Guaranteed to make people talk, oh yes. He she? Threw the drug vial to a wall. Now for the love of the great jade dragon, shut up. They were then taken to the cell they shared. That was one extra bit of cruelty, as they were chained to opposite walls so Daydara could see Tomomi in pain and not touch, not help her. She drooped her head druggly, but when the door was slammed shut, she lifted her face and her eyes were a lot clearer. Her skin was bruised and blooded and clammy, but there was a ghost of smile on her lips. That drink clearly hadn't been enough to fully divest her of her wits. I've never had a bonsai tree, she confessed to him. Of course no one was stupid enough to give me one. She slurred a little and Daydara wondered if he had understood her right. Why you claim to have one? He asked, surprised he could muster any curiosity over the issue. Well, it was obviously annoying them. It's the principal principle of the thing, Tomomi answered with a prim voice and then ruined the effect by laughing. It was a short and pained bark, but it was the real thing, going all the way up to her eyes and Daydara could only think oh shit, now I'm in trouble. How could he stand to watch her being tortured now? Yet what else could he do? This was when she threw him a sinbon she had palmed during the interrogation session, still stained with her own blood. You are the better fighter. Make it count, she said. This was the first time Daydara did what Tomomi told him to. He decided it was obviously a sensible strategy. This was the woman Daydara depended on for sanity like thirsty man depends on water. There was a reason Inoki never harmed a hair on her head despite that fateful psychological evaluation Danzo would have been wise to follow his example. Winter Kanoha didn't get much in the way of winter the village was too far in the south for the temperature to drop below zero very often. That year they hadn't gotten snow even once before Naruto had left, but the winds from the west were chilly and the weather was uncommonly wet. The rain had started the day Hokage Gigi had been buried or rather, his ashes had been buried as no one had wanted to risk rinse and repeat of the Edo Tensei catastrophe and it had only gotten more and more frequent since, like it was the summer and rainy season instead of late winter. It was even wetter than in water country and that, Naruto decided, was really kind of sad. But at least the dreadful weather meant that there were fewer people out that day. The people on duty were on duty of course, since being a loyal shinobi wasn't something that got called off on account of trouts swimming at your shoulder level, almost, but everybody who could be inside was. With the exception of one self-proclaimed blue beast of Kanoha and his student who were running around Kanoha on top of the Great Wall and shouting how the flames of the youth were keeping them dry. Was that some kind of defensive jinjutsu? Taiki managed to utter, his jaw hanging open just the littlest bit. I think the cherry blossom petals and the sunset where Tsubaki-chan muttered and pushed her wet locks off her face. I had forgotten how, uh, intense that can get. Is that even legal to do in public? Sai asked and stared at Naruto. He had more of an expression on than any of them had gotten out of the boy previously. Technically yes, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea. You try that and they will dress you in green skin-tight spandex and wake you up every morning at half past four and before you know it you'll be speaking with capital letters too and then you can't ever pull off an infiltration mission again, he cautioned Sai. Not that Sai could have pulled one off now if his life depended on it but that was an unnecessary detail. Sai asked wildly inappropriate question all the time, 
like about sexual practices from that one monk that all but swallowed his tongue, and he was just weird enough he could think making a trio out of the youthful duo was a good idea. And that, Naruto decided as he remembered one of Irika sensei's long-ago lessons, would be a war crime of some sort and committing war crimes during the peace would be even sadder than wet winter. Okay, this is our plan, he said. You, Sasuke, are our ticket through the gates without search. I mean, Sai should have travel papers you have them, right? He asked Sai, who nodded and picked a stack of papers from his pouch. The travel papers were a simple pass telling whoever looked at them that a person named here had been sent on a sanctified mission by the Hokage. Not that Anin couldn't get back to Kanoha without those, but with them it was simply a matter of walking through the gate after the two Chun invisibly standing guard checked you were the person the papers had been given to. If Anin lost the papers, he or she had to stand in front of the gates while the guards manning the post went things over the long way and jumped through every hoop to verify that the person standing in front of them had left Kanoha legitimately and wasn't in fact AWOL and after that they got slapped with a reprimand for losing the papers unless there were some really mitigating circumstances. Great, so Taiki's defecting and that's why he hasn't got papers. Everybody's going to make ballyhoo about you returning so no one should pay too much attention to Taiki and Kabuto anyway. If they insist on bothering by the book and keeping you, though, are you okay with that? He turned his head towards Taiki. Of course, the infuriatingly dry-looking man said, appearing surprised he was even asked. It had to be the Kiri thing again. Okay, if they keep you, try to stall when you tell them things. It's probably going to be at least half an hour before they get anyone to review you and after that just tell them about things before Kabuto came in detail lots of details. But don't lie. That's only going to get you into trouble, he gave the orders and Taiki assured him that he had no intention of lying to the TNI at all, even less if Marino Ibiki was the one doing the review. It was kind of funny, that people were that scared of the man. Sure, he was grumpy and scary looking, but he hadn't dragged Idate back after that tea country race by the hair so he had to be a nice person deep down. So Kabuto, can you make some sort of jinjutsu that gets you through? He turned his attention to the one this whole ballyhoo was about. Of course, Naruto-sama. I won't be invisible per se, but I will affect people's perception of me to make myself uninteresting. With Sasuke as a distraction, this should be enough. His fingers flicked through a multitude of seals so quickly they seemed to blur and then Naruto found himself looking at a you next to his friend. Ha huh, it was a good one. So he led his merry and not so merry in case of Sasuke and Sai bunch to the great gates, thinking about Danzo and Sakura-chan, though for completely different reasons. It had been a long, miserable winter, trouble after trouble after trouble after Orochimaru and Sasuke being an idiot, but now it was over. Naruto whistled as he marched up the road and Izuko and Kotetsu's eyes widened until they were rounder than Lee's. Spring Haruno Sakura was sitting on her bed, reading through one of her sensei's medical scrolls, a topic of which was the muscles of the legs. Biceps femoris part of the hamstrings group Sakura pushed the scroll away for a moment and went through everything she could remember of that particular muscle. It was a lateral muscle of posterior thigh two heads joined to different muscle groups, but what was the lower head part of again? It extended from the ischial tuberosity to the lateral condyle of tibia. It flexed the knee and extended the thigh the long head had a tendon common with the semitendinosus muscle, right? She looked at the scroll and saw that she had remembered correctly, though of course her knowledge had been incomplete. Biceps femoris was a muscle commonly injured in physical activity that required explosive bending of the knee as seen in sprinting. If the ninja was fatigued or hadn't warmed up properly they could suffer a hamstring strain or rupture, which was the tearing of the hamstring muscle. Avulsion of the biceps femoris tendon was the complete pulling away of the tendon from the bone ouch. Tsunade Sama's medical scrolls made for a really depressing reading telling all the fascinating ways ninja life could screw the human body up even without direct enemy contact. She had lately had to suppress the instinct to yell at a certain green-clad genin to be careful with his tendons, damn it, because she was the one whom Tsunade-sama was going to make fix anything that was torn. Sakura Sakura jumped up from her slouch, her heart hammering, but she didn't even have enough time to turn around when her window was thrown open and Ino jumped on her bed by her side. What are you still doing here? Haven't you heard? Ino demanded and dragged Sakura up so they both stood up the mattress dipping under their feet. Ino was still wearing her sandals and they had already left several muddy prints on Sakura's previously pristine, white sheets. 
Sakura felt a familiar sense of annoyance starting to throb at her temple where were the manners these days. Someone better have invaded us again, Ino, because she began her tirade, but Ino just shook her. Sasuke's back. Ino shouted and Sakura could not speak a word, could not move a muscle. Blood was hammering in her ears as she stood there dumbly, and Ino went on Naruto came back with him just a little while ago they went to go Dame Sama's office. There was some Kiri Jounin named Doihara who defected, I wonder how he's connected to this. Wasn't Sasuke and Odo? Sasuke was back. Sasuke was back and Sakura had no idea how to feel. After she'd had time to think her action through after Sasuke left she had felt terribly ashamed. The first part, the worst part maybe, the part that thankfully no one knew but Sasuke she had offered to leave with him. It had been a stupid spur-of-the-moment decision and as angry as she had been with Sasuke after visiting her friends in the hospital, she had been grateful he'd at least kept her from ruining her life like that. She would never have seen her parents again, and she would have missed Ino as well, and Naruto and even Kakashi-sensei, she could have never returned to her home. She would have probably died young because of her stupidity except not because Naruto wouldn't have let her. Naruto. Now there was another reason to feel ashamed of herself. She had asked him to bring Sasuke back because she had been too weak to even attempt it herself and he had wound up in a hospital for his trouble. Not that Naruto wouldn't have tried to bring Sasuke back anyway, but even then, that had been a low point for her. She had sworn to become stronger so they could do it together, drag Sasuke back by force if necessary before Orochimaru took him over, but now Naruto had kept that promise while she had been stuck learning about the muscles of human body. And despite this all she was still grinning like a loon. Go, go. Ino pushed her and Sakura exploded into motion, uncaring of her tendons and muscles. She jumped out of her window and only when her feet hit the ground she realized that she was still barefooted. The cold mud was splashing between her toes and she was almost immediately wet. My sandals, Ino! She shouted. Normally shoes were left by the front door, but Ninja kept their footwear always near and true enough, the next second Ino threw a pair of blue standard issue sandals out of the window. Another second and she was already running. It wasn't spring quite yet, not if one went by the calendar, but Sakura wouldn't have been surprised if the cherry trees of Kanoha had started to bloom there and then from the sheer force of her joy. Even if she didn't know what else to feel, about herself and Sasuke and Naruto, at least she could feel joy that they were together again. It bubbled through her veins like her blood had been changed to soda somehow and sang in her ears like birdsong. To the foxes with the calendar, Team 7 was whole again and Sakura decreed that spring had arrived at long last. Summer Tsunade's father had once told her a man will promise a lot of things in summer he won't mean in winter. It was a senja saying Kanoha at large used one that made parallels between making and delivering babies and promises to the same effect. Words were cheap. Promises were easy it was action that came hard. Naruto had unnaturally sunny disposition and he certainly promised a lot the only shinobi Tsunade had ever known foolish enough to promise not to die, ever on duty, and honestly believe in his own words. By now she was starting to believe he just might manage that, somehow. In his case it wasn't a matter of gritting his teeth through the winter though he could do that as well but somehow warping the reality and turning winter into summer. Now he had fulfilled the promise he had made to Sakura. She just really, really wished he hadn't fulfilled it like this. And you accuse Danzo of what? She asked, massaging her throbbing temples. She needed more alcohol, immediately. His actions include, but are not limited to, several counts of unsolicited assassination of Kanoha citizens, unlawfully taking Conahan orphans into custody which I believe counts as kidnapping to indoctrinate them into members of an organization Sandame Hokage made illegal and disbanded, conspiring with a foreign leader Salamander Hanzo without the knowledge of the Hokage the silver-haired boy a man at this point, really went on with almost maniacal glee shining in his eyes, not minding the two umbu standing ready to slay him at Tsunade's whim, their blades drawn. He was flanked by Naruto, who was giving her a look both pleading and so trusting it made her stomach churl, a defecting Kiri Umbu, somebody who was apparently a Kanoha shinobi and still defecting to Kanoha and Tsubaki, who looked much too unapologetic for allowing this madness to occur in the first place. And can you give me a reason why I should believe a spy of Orochimaru? She grounded out, flinching at the betrayed look in Naruto's bright, blue eyes, damn it. It wasn't becoming of a Hokage to show vulnerability, least of all in front of somebody who was bound to notice and take advantage of it. 
I'm currently a member of the root, Hokage-sama, the quiet one named Sai interrupted them. I'm a Kanoha shinobi, yet not in the register. I'm an orphan Danzo took, yet I doubt papers for my custody exist. I was sent to Makamura to assess Jaun and Ono Tsubaki's loyalties and assassinate her if I found her traitorous I don't believe this mission was endorsed by you. And it hadn't been, damn it all. All missions of this nature had to be assigned by the Hokage personally, going behind her back like this was a crime in itself and proof that the leopard hadn't changed its spots at all. Not to mention that the root still existed and that meant that she should probably get over her distaste of her traitorous teammate's reputed ex-flunky and hear what he had to say. You have half an hour, she promised darkly. Start convincing me. She came to regret those words very quickly. She tried to keep her poker face, but it wasn't helping her with this any more than it had helped her with cards. The umbu in her office were obviously shocked as well their faces might be hidden by the frozen porcelain grins, but their body language became more and more obvious, broadcasting shock and dismay. Naruto had maneuvered himself between Kabuto and Sai and was now holding their hands, his face red and his chakra flaring in a way that unnerved her, his face red with some strange exertion. These sorts of things were the reason she hadn't wanted to become Hokage in the first place. If even half of what she had just heard was true, or a tenth or a fraction of a fraction, she couldn't allow this travesty to go on anymore. Now she had to take Danzo down and that was bound to be a nightmare and a half. Enough, enough. I have heard enough. So now you profess loyalty to Kanoha again? Despite everything? She asked suspiciously. Kabuto had already proved to be deceptive and vindictive. Had he only returned to avenge himself? She couldn't even really blame him for such intentions if, again that if, his tale had been true. My primary loyalty is to Naruto-sama, but since he intends to become the Hokage, it will amount to the same thing in the end, the boy answered, undaunted. He could look so very innocent when he smiled. That was another story Tsunade needed to get out of him, he and Naruto and how that had happened but she doubted she could bear to hear it right now. And you are defecting to us because of what? She barked, pointing a dainty finger at Doihara. The man jumped a bit, but answered promptly. Naruto decided that I'm not evil enough to fit Kiri. I found that arguing with him is an exercise in futility, he said. And you are defecting as well? She asked, her finger traveling to point at Sai. I don't know. Is it possible to defect to your own village? The boy asked, and Tsunade couldn't have cared less at this point, but he went on maybe I could defect to Naruto's cult. Miwa-sensei was kind enough to teach me to chant. You have a cult? Don't blame me. It's all Taiki's fault. Naruto scrambled backwards, his arms failing about like a windmill's blades. I didn't do it on purpose, Doihara defended himself, looking distinctly pale. I didn't know he really was a Jinchuriki. And this cult had to do with the Jinchuriki? Of course, what else could it be? This was the sort of thing Naruto did, turning winter into summer. If she wasn't so proud of him, she might have cried when she anticipated the paperwork this would generate. She might yet cry anyway she wasn't paid enough to deal with this, there wasn't enough money in the world and not enough alcohol either. When the door was slammed open and her apprentice barged in, jumping at Sasuke's neck. Distraction, Kami be praised. Now Naruto out of her office yesterday. Fall. Naruto had already known, of course. Kabuto had told him, that was why they had come to Kanoha in the first place. But he got angry again, he just couldn't help it. And like all the time lately, Kyuubi was making a pest of himself, licking him with tongue of fire. But this time he could almost see it even though he was wide awake. It was like there was something orange and red just at the edge of his vision, something that moved but when he turned his head it disappeared like water disappeared into dry sand. And there were words, just at the edges of his range of hearing. Rudo, your precious M.O.T. like the cries and storm winds, almost words, almost there. Okage, you think sage red wind, so red. Proud of his desk you have a cult? Tsunade Bachan screamed, and it was like he had been balancing on a rope and now someone pushed him. The red shadows were gone with a crash and so was the voice, leaving him to the tender mercies of Tsunade Bachan. Her face was plenty red, though, and her eyes glittered. It was really ominous glittering. Don't blame me. It's all Taiki's fault. He pleaded, all too happy to put the blame where it belonged. This was when the door was slammed open and Sakura-chan barged in. 
She was wet from head to toe and her hair lay flat against her head, now a darker shade of pink, almost red. Her hem was dirty and dripping. She was still the prettiest girl Naruto had ever seen. Sasuke Kuin she breathed and jumped at his neck. I missed you so. It hurt a little to watch her fawn over her precious Sasuke Kuin, but Naruto smiled all the same. He was the one to bring Sasuke back so he was the one to make her smile so prettily, in a way, right? But then Sakura-chan took a step back and delivered a harsh slap to Sasuke's face. Naruto's jaw dropped as the sound of flesh hitting flesh echoed in the room. How could you do that? Doesn't the word desertion mean anything to you? And you tried to kill Naruto. Don't try to tell me you didn't mean to, you put in a rank assassination jutsu through his chest, who does that to a teammate? He could have died, anyone else would have. Have you no heart? Sakura-chan's voice reached a pitch Naruto had previously thought human throat couldn't manage and she punctured her tirade with one more slap, after which she threw her hands around Sasuke's neck again. At least you are back now, you can make it better. That's good, she crowed. It was a pretty quick mood swing, but it wasn't like Naruto was really angry either. Being friends was like the fall when the leaves fell you didn't kick the trees, you encouraged them to try again next year. Besides, Sasuke's both cheeks glowed red from her strikes and he stood still and straight like an iron rod, his face panicked like a mouse's when it stood in front of a snake and that was really hilarious. Naruto snickered a bit, but that only turned Sakura-chan's attention to him. Now he took a step back, suddenly unnerved. She was obviously kind of unhinged from the happiness and who could tell what she might do. He had done nothing to deserve a slap. Naruto, thank you. You are a wonderful person and I'm so happy you are my teammate," she said solemnly and gathered him into a hug. Now it was his turn to stand still, his arms rigid against his sides. His eyes were stinging and he blinked them rapidly he wasn't going to cry, really. His heart was so warm and fluttered so hard it almost hurt and he was so happy he wouldn't have cared if she had slapped him right then. He would have done anything for her, moved mountains and beaten armies all alone. You. Now Sakura-chan pushed him away suddenly and turned to the side. Naruto stood there confused, wondering if now was the time for the slap, and then saw that she had turned towards Kabuto. Traitor. She hissed, her fingers spread like a bird's claws. Hey, he's the one who brought Sasuke back to me. In that barrel too, he defended his friend's character. And the barrel had been a nice touch, really. Is that so? Then thank you, I guess, she said hesitantly. She didn't look happy to thank Kabuto, but she looked less ready to horribly maim him at least. Kabuto smiled in a sheepish manner and tried to look appeasing. Is she suffering from bipolar disorder? Sai asked. How she passed her psychological evaluation. This in turn made Sakura-chan screech again in indignation. As heartwarming this scene is, this really isn't the time and place for it, Tsunade Bachan said dryly and muttered something about the evils of the paperwork that awaited her. Make Danzo do it when you catch him. He deserves it anyway, Naruto proposed and grinned when unholy light lit the Hokage's eyes. I think I will. And I'll castrate Jiraiya for leaving you alone for whole two months. What was he thinking would happen? The right answer probably wasn't not this. She was rubbing her knuckles and grinning really, really ominously. Kabuto was the one to suggest that the happy reunion could be relocated to the waiting chamber outside the office as the participants weren't really necessary to the conversation anyway. Naruto wasn't stupid and he remembered there was something Kabuto thought he shouldn't hear or ask, but he really didn't want to leave either Sakura-chan or Sasuke right then, and if it was something he needed to know, then Tsunade Bachan would tell him anyway. He happily let himself be herded out along with his teammates and Sai. Passing Naruto-sama can't find out. He couldn't keep this from Sasuke and he must not find out. The Uchiha are never the most stable people from begin with it's the strain improvident use of the Sharingan causes on the brain, Kabuto said. Damn you, Danzo, Tsunade whispered. Damn you to hell for this. Because they might have managed to avoid the catastrophe so far, but they had no way of knowing just how many people knew and how inclined they might be to keep the secret or to reveal it. Three could keep a secret, they said, if two were dead. May Danza rot in hell, for one day this skeleton would claw its way out of the closet and then there would be hell to pay. Rain. A long time ago Sai had a brother who called himself Shin. He didn't know if Shin was his brother's real name, a code name given to him or simply something he had made up, 
but Shin was Shin and in a show of life's great ironies he dubbed his cute little brother Sai. It was written with different kanji than Sai's code name, but the kanji used meant to offer prayers so the irony ended up counting anyway. Shin wasn't related to Sai by blood as far as they knew though admittedly they didn't know anything about their blood families so it was a possibility, however minuscule but Shin insisted that genetics weren't a minimum requirement at all. Young Sai had no idea what genetics meant, but he was inclined to take Shin's word for it back when Shin lived. They only ever had one mission together. It had been the mission that got Sai blooded as part of the Roots desensitization program and the target was simply a merchant who had somehow caused some harm to Kanoha. Don't ask me what he did. Maybe he sells to IWA too. Maybe he committed a tax fraud. It doesn't really matter anyway, Shin had told Sai. He was there as a senior operative to ensure things went smoothly and to witness the killing. Sai could remember it was a beautiful, sunny day and the merchant had reserved a room from an inn that coincidentally looked over a steep cliff to a river that divided the town in two. The river was only deep enough there that the water reached a grown man to a waist, but the flow of it was fast, the water was very cold and most importantly the bottom of the river was full of big, sharp rocks. Sai, Shin had sighed. It was supposed to look like a natural death. This reproach had made Sai very confused. Isn't it natural to die if one falls out of the window into a river and is knocked unconscious underwater? He had asked. Maybe if the window had been open, Shin had groaned, taken his hand and sunshined them both away. Now it was raining, Sai's name meant rhinoceros and he had betrayed Danzo it had been the last minute to do so, figuratively speaking, as he had already been scheduled for a curse seal application like all root ninja. Only this mission had delayed it and Sai wondered if the sensation of lightness located within his chest was a psychosomatic symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. He was almost sure he wasn't traumatized, but no one had ever explained to him what being traumatized felt like so he couldn't be sure. He was standing in the waiting chamber outside the Hokage's office and witnessing as Naruto spoke of his travels with Jiraiya and great ramen bars, Sakura spoke of her medical studies and their Jounin sensei Kakashi who was out of village for a mission and they both ganged up on Sasuke, asking questions and receiving mostly one-syllable answers. So Aero sensei offended this Miko and let me tell you, some of them can do seriously weird shit when they get angry Naruto looked like he was going to explain, but this was when Sasuke decided to volunteer a sentence. Can't all women? He asked. This made Naruto grimace and look at Sakura, but she only threw her head back and laughed. Keep that in mind. I know where your tendons are, you know, she threatened, yet her words made Naruto grin and Sasuke appeared unconcerned. Can threats of violence be used as a form of bonding? He asked. Sakura and Sasuke turned to give him a look that was disbelieving was close and so was exasperated, but Sai was certain he was missing some important nuance. Personhood the art of being fully human had red love is also heavy rain that falls freely and washes away the hurts and chains of the corrupt heart of man and, like thirsting saplings, the heart reaches up to the heavens, and the cry of it calls aloud for relief from thence. In the beginning it was a sunny day, Sai's name meant offering prayers and he threw a man out of a window. Now it was raining, Sai's name had changed and he was leaning back against a window. It wasn't locked. Only if they know you don't really mean it or if they know you mean it with love and stuff. But don't get it mixed with masochism, though Sakura-chan probably suffers from that too, what with having a thing for the bastard after this thing's happened quickly. Sakura punched Naruto, who should have been able to dodge it, but for some reason declined to do so. He was thrown back towards Sai and Sai could have dodged, but he wanted to catch Naruto. He managed, but the force behind the punch threw him back as well and the window was thrown open. It was the end of one chapter of his life, it was raining and Sai had just been thrown out of a window. He noted it was nice symmetry. He even laughed a little as he flipped over in the air. Of course he and Naruto were all right. They weren't ninja for nothing. Snow. The plan Tsunade put together was simple, out of necessity they were on a time limit and the moment Danzo found out either Kabuto or Sai were back in Kanoha they would lose the element of surprise. And they needed that surprise, badly. According to Sai there were currently 20 children under the age of 16 in the root, not counting himself, 15 of them under the age of 12 and 5 were precisely 5 years old new recruits something Tsunade found completely revolting. If these kids, half trained in the best cases, got between her umbu and Danzo's jounin in a fight it was going to be ugly. The attack was to be three-pronged. 
Tsunade had sent a message to Danzo about Uchiha Sasuke's return a message she was certain he didn't need anymore and an order to arrive to meet her in her office. What was waiting for him there was an ambush and Shizun disguised as Tsunade to lure the man inside. Her student couldn't fool Danzo for long, but hopefully long enough for him to close the door behind him. Another part of this operation was going to be the house arrest of Yudatane Koharu and Mitokado Hamura. Tsunade wanted to believe they had simply been subtly controlled by Danzo's stolen Sharingan, but she couldn't allow them to roam freely before the situation had settled and they had been officially cleared of all accusations. The second prong was the Operation Think About the Children, the one Tsunade was personally leading. According to Sai and Kabuto, damn the creepy man Naruto had decided to adopt like a stray puppy, the root trainees had different schedules depending on their skill level and classes, but they all ate at the same time in the same place. The plan was to sneak in at dinner time and hopefully avoid fighting, catch them in the trainee mess hall and start to order them around. This was why Tsunade was needed personally. These children were trained to be fanatically loyal to Kanoha and Tsunade was the current military dictator of the village, however little Danzo liked this fact. There was no telling if these child operatives would acknowledge the normal village hierarchy and take orders from her Jounin, but Tsunade doubted that even Danzo had gone as far as to denounce the position of the Hokage, especially since it was a position he had his eyes on. As long as there were no conflicting orders from the Warhawk, the children should follow Tsunade's orders like good little drones. Should. The third prong would be the main assault of the root headquarters after Tsunade go the children out, or if and when the distress signal came. Rooting out the agents who weren't in the headquarters would be a nightmare and the cleanup of the agents embedded in other villages would probably take years, but if everything went to a plan the main force should be crushed in an afternoon. Again, should. Tsunade was holding up an umbrella and giving the maps I had drawn for them a last glance. They stood in front of an entrance to an old civilian shelter that had been abandoned after the QB attack because of structural damage that had been inflicted on it. It should have been demolished years ago, but somehow the issue had gotten lost in the bureaucratic swamp of the village administration. Why am I not surprised, she drawled and pushed the map down her cleavage. Sigh, take point. Cat, behind me, you are responsible of the Genjutsu, ASP, you advance on the ceiling. Neutralize any guards we encounter. Silently. A second later only Sai could be seen entering the shelter. The above-ground part of the shelter was a sturdy, grey cube with a door. The below-ground level was a bigger grey cubicle space with everything stripped off except, of course, an entry into a sewer separate from the main Kanoha sewer network. After a long climb down, a hundred crouched, narrow meters and two turns the sewer got rather absurdly spacious for a sewer. This was when they met the first guard. It was a woman with mouse-brown short hair, a mask that depicted some sort of bird on her face and her hand on the handle of her tonto. ID and identification code, the woman demanded with a toneless voice. ID Route 522. A red hand hanging from a tree, a silent sentinel under the tree's roots. Standing silent, loyal to the end, Sai answered with an equally flat voice. It was a nonsense sentence like all Kanoha identification codes, but not one Tsunade knew and as a Hokage she was supposed to know them all. The guard stepped aside, only to fall back, her throat slid open. She was angry as she stepped over the body that Kat's Jinjutsu swiftly hid from view. There had been no need for that woman to die but Danzo's delusions. Kanoha was a village of special snowflakes and while it wasn't quite as nice a place as the propaganda tended to paint it as, the truth was that they encouraged individuality as they best could in the framework of loyalty to the village. Kanoha could and would demand its tithe in life and limb, in blood and tears and a series of funerals to attend to, but identity, the right to pursue personal happiness despite the risks? No. Danzo. Had. No. Right. She was fuming as they passed one more guard before entering the trainee Barak division, luckily a low-level security area. There, Sai said and pointed towards a closed door. There is likely at least one adult operative supervising. Good, Tsunade growled and cracked her knuckles. It's time to save my little snowflakes. And she kicked the door open. Lightning. Kabuto waited in the small antechamber behind the hidden door in the Hokage's office, waiting with five umbu. He knew better than to think that he was trusted by anyone except Naruto-sama, but the Hokage was banking on his hatred of Danzo to not turn on her shinobi mid-battle and if he happened to die taking Danzo down, one less headache for her. 
he understood that the woman was fond of Naruto-sama, which was a good thing considering her surprisingly ruthless streak, but he would have to keep an eye on her regardless. Politics could turn even a mouse into a monster. He knew the moment Danzo stepped into the office. There wasn't a single audible step, the door didn't creak or click shut, but the tinge of Uchiha in the chakra of the man was impossible to mistake. They all acted as one. Sable shunshined between Danzo and the door, barring the way out, while Siro took her place between the man and the window. Martin, Squirrel and Crane flickered into a half-circle that left Danzo now completely surrounded. Kabuto simply stepped into the office and Danzo's head immediately turned towards him he didn't feel even the slightest hint of the fury he had half expected to consume him when he finally stood in front of the man, ready to take him down. Instead it was like all his blood had turned to ice water so cold it burned from within. He was going to kill Danzo and there was no joy in the thought. But there was satisfaction. There was a sense of completion. What is the meaning of this, Shizun? Danzo asked. Well, they hadn't really expected to fool the man any real amount of time. Shizun allowed her henge to fade and stood up, sending the legs of the chair scraping backwards on the floor. You are under suspicion of several counts of unsolicited assassination, several counts of kidnapping of a Kanoha citizen Shizun went through the shortlist while Danzo stood in the ring of bared steel, seemingly unaffected. He was an old, wrinkled man, frail-looking, leaning on a cane no one relaxed an inch because of this. Please surrender into our custody pending further investigation into your affairs, Shizun finished her piece. It needed to be said, Kabuto suspected, if for formality's sake only. So be it, then. Daytapa. The sad way Danzo inclined his head didn't fool Kabuto in the least. He flickered his way through a series of seals that allowed the wind to simply whirl around him, but the umbu and Shizun weren't as well prepared or as nimble of hand and they were blown away against the walls the desk falling over Shizun with a crash and a bookcase almost hitting one of the umbu. Kabuto struck at Danzo too quick for the man to evade him and the strike connected cleanly and with full force. He felt the body of his enemy break beneath his hand, but even as the man landed in a heap, his back twisted at a seemingly unnatural angle, Kabuto knew that it had been much too easy. Martin was foolish enough to prove this by leaping to the old counselor's side and taking a lightning-quick wind jutsu to the chest, falling bleeding on the floor. Fighting in an enclosed space was a skill of its own. Kabuto stepped to the side and watched as Shizun made a daring spurt into the middle of the melee and dragged the badly bleeding man to the minuscule safety the antechamber offered and begun to heal him, her hands glowing gently blue. It was impossible to shun Shin away from the entirety that the office and the antechamber formed in the heavily enforced walls withstood the tail end of the jutsu strikes that shredded flesh and furniture and covered the floor in water. But while Danzo was the one who inflicted the most damage in the fight, he couldn't seem to finish his opposition. The man was getting on in years. What an uncomfortable age that must be. Now if you'd asked my advice, I'd have told to stay twenty-five but it's much too late now, he remarked amicably. The water was up to his ankles now and colored delicate, translucent pink. One can hardly stay twenty-five their whole life, unless they sink to Orochimaru's levels. Danzo answered nonchalantly and dodged a strike from Crane's tonto. Or yours, was the implication. Kabuto found his mouth stretching into a genuine smile of amusement. Stealing a whole body is wrong, but stealing eyes is all right? Do your morals operate on a weight-based system? Kabuto inquired and his suspicion that Danzo was more tired than he appeared was confirmed when the man only froze for the briefest of moments before dodging a fire jutsu that left the walls smoldering and pulled at the bandages covering the right side of his face. The shortlist hadn't included bloodline theft and Kabuto wondered if the man had still thought he could get away with it all and remain in Kanoha. Besides, one perhaps can't help growing older, but two can. With proper assistance you could have ceased at twenty-five. Well, better late than never, I suppose. And without further ado he leaped into the battle again. It was a trick, a feint, this partially reverse-engineered jutsu. He grabbed Danzo's left hand and made a one-handed seal with both their hands. Old or not, Danzo was good. As a snake slithered out from underneath Kabuto's sleeve Siro, her face now bared by her cracked mask, exhaled wind infused chakra onto her tonto to make it longer, deadlier. Danzo twirled both their bodies around, forcing Kabuto to drop on his knees on the wet floor. Siro and Squirrel both struck as Kabuto's snake sunk its teeth into both of their arms and at the same moment Danzo exhaled blasts of wind blades none of them could dodge at such short range. 
Then several things happened at once. The poison Kabuto was immune to, that Danzo in all likelihood could neutral as well, was released into their bloodstream. The wind blades stuck through Kabuto's flesh, forcing a pained groan from his lips as red and black spots danced across his vision. But this was the part where he had modified Enko's jutsu, when he released a blast of lightning chakra through the snake's body. Kabuto had been stranger to elation for as long as he could remember, but the sight of Danzo being bodily flung by the lightning bolt struck through him with a rush of the best endorphin release technique. The walls would have withstood the impact easily, but Danzo hit the closed window. Thunder. The door wasn't locked and Tsunade kicked it open with no effort at all. The head of every person in the mess hall turned towards her, standing seemingly alone in the doorway, Sai hidden behind her form. It was a mirthless place, with bare gray walls, plain long tables without tablecloths and plain long benches, no carpets on bare gray floor and the children dressed in similar plain clothes, in dark blue and black under the harsh, yellow light of the light bulb without a lampshade. Tsunade was distantly aware that her killing intent thrummed through the room in almost audible thunder. She was so out of control it was unacceptable but maybe it was appropriate all the same. After all, wasn't this whole mess the proverbial lighting from the clear sky, and didn't thunder always follow lightning? There was a man in the room. He wore no mask, but as he flickered to Tsunade in the space between two heartbeats his face was so blank there wasn't much difference. He was quick and silent and powerful, he was merciless, he was at umbu level he was so outmatched it wasn't even fun. Tsunade struck fast and she struck bloodlessly to spare the children a little shock, and the man toppled over, groaning a little. These rash youngsters, she sighed and shook her head sadly. They don't make insurgents like they used to. Back when we fought in rain the children jumped up, drawing kunai, wakazashi and other short swords, the youngest grabbing shuriken and all of them ready to jump her. Tsunade had to hide a smirk. Completely brash, a little fire and no survival instincts at all maybe they weren't that different from normal students after all. I am Godame Hokage Senju Tsunade and that man was a traitor to Kanoha. She thundered. Stand down and lower your weapons, soldiers. Twenty children froze momentarily, their faces reflecting hesitance, some more, some almost managing to hide it. She is the Hokage. I have seen a picture of her, one of the older children said, a boy with brown, cropped hair. Immediately all children hid their kunai and swords and bowed deeply to her. Hokage-sama, they chanted as an eerie underground choir. Not one of them asked a question. We are fighting traitors to Kanoha now, Tsunade spoke to them no need to tell the root forces were the traitors here, not yet. You are to follow me and my men above ground. Don't engage in battle unless directly ordered to. I declare you ameliorated. Her words were met with pensive silence. But Hokage-sama, there aren't any windows we could be thrown out of is this why we are going to the upper levels? The same boy who had recognized her spoke with the slightest strain in his voice. Tsunade blinked. No, that's defenestrate. She means something else, a thin, doe-eyed girl corrected the boy. Tenseness barely there eased at her words and Tsunade realized much to her horror that the kids really had thought she wanted to throw them out of a window I thought defenestrating meant gelding, the bell-clear voice of a tiny, androgynous child rung out from the middle of the crowd. No, that's castrating and it doesn't count as a natural cause of death even if they are drunk, yet another kid answered. Except if the dead person is Jiraiya-sama. Hare Senpai said so, but she didn't explain why. Wasn't that sabotage? The girl asked. That too, I guess, if they have a really important Kekiai Genkai, but vitiating means sabotaging, the silver-voiced child mused and bit his lower lip appearing absurdly adorably precocious. Also, wholly disturbing. To ameliorate means making something or someone better. Now, make a crocodile, follow me and don't make any noise, Tsunade interrupted the word of the day calendar recital before it got completely out of hand. She made a mental note that she needed to make several therapists' appointments because if children barely of age to enter the academy were contemplating castration as a viable sabotage strategy none of the children were moving. Do you mean an area effect Jinjutsu, Hokage-sama? Or should we hinge ourselves as crocodiles? The boy who had first spoken up asked her. The youngest haven't been taught either yet. Just form pairs, grab each other's hands and follow me. Tsunade barked, painfully aware that the clock was ticking seconds away and they could be discovered any minute now. And like the world was mocking her, that was when a huge boom rattles the floor under their feet like an underground thunderstorm 
the echoes bouncing off the walls. What had happened? They hadn't sent the distress signal and the attack wasn't supposed to start before her group got out. She herded the children out of the mess hall with the help of Kat and Sai, ASP keeping watch in an intersection of tunnels, and swore to herself that unless there were some really mitigating circumstances she was going to do some defenestrating, castrating being a very real possibility as well. Storm. It had been a nice, mild winter so far, but now the fierce wind and the clouds massing southeast of IWA suggested that a storm was on its way, and it was going to be a big one. It was half past midnight and Daydara was walking home from the mission office, dusty from the road, tired and annoyed and hoping Tomomi hadn't been sent on a mission alone while he had been running after a turned informant halfway across the country. It wasn't that she didn't know how to take care of herself, but he always worried anyway. What if a client lied about the mission parameters? What if the situation simply shifted in an unfavorably way? Daydara knew that few plans survived contact with the enemy and any random missing Neen wandering through the area might cause trouble. It wasn't that he didn't trust Tomomi to take care of herself, but if the unlikely happened and something happened to her he walked through the almost empty streets up to Tomomi's house. Iwabakir no Sato was built in a bowl-shaped valley surrounded by steep rock formations and cliff faces and Tomomi's house was one of the upper ones. It was a real house that even had a handkerchief-sized garden, not an apartment, but it was awkwardly shaped long and narrow with a bathroom where sitting on the toilet required pushing the knees into the shower and a kitchen that was according to Tomomi a head injury hazard if even one cabinet door was left open. This was why she was able to afford it with the Chunin wages. He had thought about asking her to move in with her, but the time was never right, somehow. If they weren't interrupted by someone at a fateful moment, she'd had a bad day or one of her friends had just been widowed and he always lost his nerve at the last moment. But the life of a ninja was short and perilous and he was determined. Today he would ask her. It was too late. Daydara returned to tracks of blood on the floor and the clay statue he had made for Tomomi in pieces on the living room floor. Tomomi, he whispered, a cold, cold hand squeezing his heart, desperation bringing a tang of numb disbelief and despair to his tongue. He walked the apartment like in a bad dream, thinking how she had been supposed to be safe in the village. Through the living room and into the bedroom through the kitchen the bedroom window was open. No ninja worth their first shuriken would leave a window open, but then, Tomomi hadn't left of her own free will, now had she? There was a bloody handprint on the window sill and Daydara leaned over it, thinking about how easy it would be to die here, watching over the long drop to the lower levels of the village. But Tomomi had said that suicide wasn't an answer. She had said that wimpy defeatist attitude wasn't allowed in her house. He couldn't jump out of her window. But when he took a step back his foot hit something, sending it clattering over the floor. The house was dark and Daydara had to kneel to find the little thing a piece of ceramic armor. It was a thin sliver that curved ever so slightly, bone white with a reddish-brown stain and a bright red line. He had to fumble for a light to make certain, but yes, in the corner of that curvy piece of ceramic was the end of a red line. It was a piece of a mask. It was a piece of a mask and Tomomi was nowhere to be seen and there was blood on the floor Daydara couldn't remember how he stumbled back into the living room, but there his foot hit a piece of clay sending it clattering all over the floor. The noise echoed in his ears the drum beat and he stared, he stared, he remembered. A part of him was thinking of practicalities, of the inner sanctuary and the Tsuchikage's private library and the classified section of the mission archives as the shattered statue of a dove filled his whole field of vision. Another part finally, finally understood why Tomomi had said that suicide wasn't an answer. She had been right, like always. He had just lost the only person who had ever understood him when even his parents had flinched away from his precocious, disquieting questions. It wasn't fair, but he wasn't looking for fair and he wasn't looking for death either not for his own death, anyway. I will be a good shinobi for you, Tomomi chan I will find out who is responsible. And then he looked at the broken piece of art on the floor and smiled. He wasn't looking for fairness, he was just looking for who he could point the blame at and blast away. Art is a blast. Broken. Kanaha had two councils the council proper and the assembly. While the Hokage was the military dictator of the village and on paper had the last word in absolutely everything, in practice he or she had to listen to the other powers that be simply to keep the cogs running smoothly and to avoid turning the village into Kumo or, gods forbid, Kiri. The council proper consisted of the Hokage's appointed advisors and it was most often consulted on matters of the village. 
Danzo had been a strange in-between person, not officially a member of the council, but often taking part in its meetings all the same. But right now Danzo was the issue and the council proper was under house arrest, hopefully only until they were found innocent hopefully they would be found innocent. So the day after the second dissolving of the root Tsunade called together the assembly. The composition of the assembly was more fluid than the council propers. The major clan leaders were usually part of it, as were the ninja holding an office of importance and when the matters concerned trade and other civilian business the representatives of the civilian powers were invited as well. The rule of the thumb was that everyone who needed to be heard would take part. In this instance, as the case of Danzo and the Root was strictly military matter and classified seven ways to Sunday, the only people present were the Hyuga, Nara, Yamanaka, Akimichi, Aburame and Inazuka clan leaders and Marino Ibiki in the capacity of the head of the torture and interrogation. Order in the council room. Tsunade called over Tsum's bickering with Hayashi and Shibi's speculation over the return of Sasuke and the rumors of Danzo falling off the Hokage's window with Shikaku, hitting the table with enough force to send a crack through it. Gentlemen and lady. And Ibiki. Ibiki nodded his head towards her as his name was called, the twitch of his lips stretching his scars. I am aware that many rumors are circulating in the village regarding yesterday's occurrences. It was indeed a busy day and I have called you here to confirm several of those rumors. This is true Uzumaki Naruto brought Uchiha Sasuke back to the village, along with a defector from Oto and another from Kiri. Tsunade felt a little bad leaving Tsubaki's name off this initial announcement, but Tsubaki was already a jounin and while ninja were supposed to be exempt from the effects of the first impression, while well they were only human, with the possible exception of Hyuga Hayashi who Tsunade was certain had become the anthropomorphic personification of stuffiness when the late Uchiha Fugaku had left the post open post-mortem. She wanted these people to think Naruto whenever they though the return of the Uchiha. Good boy. Tsum's laugh was throaty, bark-like, wild. But her good humor didn't last. Hope you are belling that cat good and proper, Tsunade. My son came back from that rescue mission bleeding. And he wasn't even the one hurt badly, she barked, prompting a distressed noise and white knuckles from Chusa. His son's life had hanged by a thin, fraying thread, only saved when Shikamaru had granted Tsunade a use of the Nara clan's medical book, something completely unprecedented. She didn't comment, knowing that was an argument best left to another day. This is also true Danzo has been found guilty of several counts of high treason and many lesser offenses. The root has been disbanded the second time and he died yesterday resisting arrest. Counselors Mito Kato and Yudatane are under house arrest pending the results of the investigation into their actions, Tsunade declared instead, and as the voices were raised in questions, protests and general shock she knew that nothing short of the second coming of Kyuubi would bring an order to this chaos for a good long while. Tsunade had wanted Danzo taken in alive if at all possible, but the reports of her umbu made it clear that as much as would have liked to blame Kabuto for going against her orders, Danzo hadn't shown any signs of intending to surrender and had even been on offensive for a good part of the fight. He had survived the initial electrocution and the fall off the tower with a few third-degree burns on his arm, two cracked ribs, a concussion and a broken ulna long life of molding chakra made even an old body sturdy like that. But in the end he hadn't been in any condition to counteract the poison of the snake technique Kabuto had reverse-engineered from Enko and while Shizun had tried to save his life her efforts had been in vain. But maybe it was for the best. The old adage about a clan divided not standing firm had survived all these centuries for a reason. Not that the Hyuga were going to admit it or anything, but that was neither here nor there. Granted, Danzo hadn't shouldered the whole blame for the Uchiha would-be uprising. While a good shinobi, Uchiha Fugaku hadn't been an apt politician and his refusal to compromise on anything had painted his clan nicely into the political corner. The whole clan had been proud to the point of being stupid and refused to admit even to the possibility of a bastard Sharingan holder, never mind that many shinobi had to take that sort of mission as well as kunoichi and sometimes condoms just broke or were faulty and that teenagers weren't always, or ever, the most responsible people even in the most respectable clans. And certainly nobody twisted their proverbial arm behind their proverbial back and forced them to conspire against the village. But the rumors about the Uchiha being behind the Kyuubi attack could be traced to Danzo's doorstep. Danzo had certainly played on Fugaku's refusal to compromise, demanding the clan accept this, that and the other limitation to prove their loyalty and then working to undermine the trust of the other clans with every refusal. He had driven the Uchiha to stand back to back, all living in the compound, 
and then blamed them of secularism. Towards the end of his witch hunt the Uchiha had been almost as much outcasts as Naruto and that was saying something. Tsunade couldn't even tell if Danzo had honestly thought the Uchiha were a threat and had created an enemy where once had been an ally or if his motives had been less altruistic. The autopsy done on his body had certainly been telling. Maybe it was for the best that the man was gone for good, with no chance to wriggle out of his just desserts. Kanoha had been broken for a long time and he had been the one conquering his own by dividing, driving wedges between comrades in arms. Where Danzo had broken Naruto fixed. And maybe, just maybe he could fix things once more when not if, but when Sasuke inevitably found out and things got broken again. Fixed. The day after Sasuke's return to Kanoha and the battle against the route saw the group confined to the Uchiha compound, discreetly watched by several umbu to make sure everyone stayed where they had been ordered to. In Sasuke's case this was because Tsunade was worried about him changing his mind the last second and running away again before his hearing. In Kabuto's case the restrictions weren't as much about him possibly running away as they were about what he could do in Kanoha if left unchecked. Naruto was ordered to stay there and keep an eye on them because he had the best track record with the two and the whole mess was at least half his fault as far as Tsunade was concerned. Sai and Taiki were thrown into the bargain because as new defectors they had to be kept under careful watch as well and that job was handed to Tsubaki as an unofficial punishment because she had failed to keep an eye and reins on Naruto. She had then mildly pointed out that maybe that wasn't the best referral she could have for a job like this, a comment which had earned her an account book to the forehead and a quick trip to the compound. Sakura didn't really have to stay with the rest of them, but it would have taken greatly superior numbers and a bloody battle to keep her out. Naruto had asked Kabuto to look after Sai and keep him from annoying the umbu, pretty pleased with fish cake on top, and Taiki was busy teaching Tsubaki some water jutsu sword strike combination. This only left one cloud darkening the happy blue sky. AD rank. Sasuke complained. They made me AD rank. Naruto grimaced as he thought of the mission ranking his and Tsubaki-chan's charges had been given. He was convinced that was just extra bit of punishment for the great sin of generating more paperwork for the Hokage-sama, but since he was basically getting paid for hanging out with his friends he figured he couldn't complain. I think they are snubbing me, actually wait. What was he even thinking? Never mind, it's obviously all about you, he corrected himself. They were all in the great living room of Sasuke's old house, cleaning the place. It had been left abandoned since the jerk had run away with Orochimaru and a force of vicious dust bunnies had invaded the place, strengthened their positions and now they were waging siege warfare against the resettlers. The casualties so far included Sakura-chan's prettier cleaning clothes, worn and a bit small, but also very becoming shade of pink, and seven cleaning rags. Now, now, boys, there is plenty of blame to share, Sakura-chan chastised them gently, attacking a trench behind a bookcase with a lofty swing of her duster. It's clearly both of you. Ma, it's good to see you all so lively, a very familiar voice spoke from behind them. They all jumped from surprise and turned swiftly around. There in the doorway slouched a very familiar figure holding a very familiar-looking orange book in his hand. To think I return from a mission to find that the lost boy has found his way back home at last. Kakashi Sensei's words were lazy, soft, but when he stepped inside Naruto just got the feeling like someone had dropped a full crate of something really heavy on really soft, yieldy mattress. The whole room seemed to dip from the sudden intensity in the air and he felt the need to say something, anything, to ease it a bit. Sasuke's been demoted to D rank. He was quick to quip and then he could breathe again. Luckily he was quick enough to dodge the punch Sasuke aimed at him as well. I'm going to kill you. Sasuke growled, but didn't actually jump at Naruto he hid behind Kakashi Sensei's back just to be certain and struck his tongue out at Sasuke. Nyay. He taunted his teammate. Sasuke's face was a picture of pure disbelief. Naruto's founded a cult, Sakura-chan joined in with a sing-song tattletale voice, leaning against the wall. Her smile was really, really pretty and Naruto thought it was a great shame and crime she tried to hide it behind her hand. But Sakura-chan's learned a hard exploding jutsu from Kabuto, he countered. The cult was really Taiki's fault, Kabuto joined in, walking through the door. Kakashi-sensei tensed a little, shifting his weight to the balls of his feet, ready to spring into motion. Kabuto just smiled beatifically. I merely saved Naruto from becoming Yakuza, Taiki protested, walking in behind Kabuto. Sai and Tsubaki followed as well, crowding the room very thoroughly. 
Sai was too busy staring at them like they were all doing something terribly fascinating to say anything, luckily. That was half Tsubaki-chan's fault. Naruto protested as Kakashi-sensei's raised eyebrow turned towards his direction. It was creepy how well that eyebrow could talk. But Naruto started it. Tsubaki-chan tattled that traitor. No apple dumplings for her. Well, well, Kakashi's mouth drawled, while his single visible eyebrow clearly asked when being Naruto had turned into a socially transmitted disease, somehow. It even had a great sarcastic lilt Naruto was very proud he had managed to inspire it. I see you are having a great time regressing to academy students. Don't tell Tsunade-bachan. We are supposed to be suffering as much as she is, Naruto shushed him and Sakura-chan laughed. It made something deep inside him relax at last, something that had been tied into knots for so long he hadn't even noticed anymore. Sasuke team had returned, Kakashi-sensei was there and Sakura-chan was laughing. His team was finally fixed, Kabuto had returned, he had a lot of new friends and all was well in the world now. Light. Sakura didn't particularly like or trust Kabuto, but she had learned that heart-exploding medical jutsu from him. There was a reason for this. She was making an effort for the future. Out of Team 7 Sakura was the only one with a chance of normalcy, for any given value of normal the life of a kunoichi could hold. Naruto was doomed from the birth he was holding Kyuubi and the Akatsuki was after him because of that. Sasuke was doomed from the moment Itachi went out of his mind and killed his whole clan now he had to somehow get revenge despite Itachi being, well, Itachi and creeps like Orochimaru were after him because he was the last Sharingan holder unless Itachi counted. And again, Itachi. Sakura would have been very surprised if anyone had decided to go after that man when Sasuke was still an option. But Sakura had her chance of a relatively simple life and good life expectancy. She could make Chunin and become a good field medic with a few good jinjutsu to throw at her enemies. She could get married to Sasuke or someone else and retire from active service to raise children. It would be respectable enough. Please teach me, Kabuto-sensei, she asked bowed to the man like a good pupil should. She didn't like him and she didn't trust him, but she figured she could trust Naruto to screw even the most messed up head in the world straight. Aren't you already Godame student, Sakura-chan? Why come to me? Kabuto asked, but Sakura got the feeling that he wasn't refusing her as much as he was weighing her. The brightest light casts the darkest, sharpest shadows. Sakura thought of Sasuke Kuen and Naruto and her smile illuminated the darkening courtyard. The shadow she cast behind her would have done Inara proud. Tsunade sure shows the best medic in the world and she could beat you in a fight, hands down, but she wouldn't I want to learn to fight dirty. I want to learn to take down someone leagues above myself by doing something totally underhanded. Please, at least give me pointers on what kind of techniques I should develop. Not that Sakura would ever do anything too evil, like that terrifying Edo Tensei technique for example, because she had standards. But she didn't have a biju or that strange charisma of Naruto that could apparently be weaponized as a kind of an unholy bastard offspring of therapy and a mind control jutsu. She didn't even have Kekiai Genkai or any inborn genius. She was just a clever girl with naturally low chakra reserves and good chakra control to make up for it. She was a just a girl with a chance for normal and two teammates who were anything but. Screw normal, Haruna Sakura was making an informed decision. She was scared, so scared, but people who abandoned their teammates were worse than trash. One day she would stand out in the fields against Itachi or Kisame or some other shinobi their caliber and they would never see her coming. Dark. Naruto managed to drag Kakashi-sensei out of the house eventually. It wasn't easy because he insisted on supervising the cleaning of the house, which Naruto was sure was an excuse to stare at Sasuke and make sure he really was there and watch he wasn't going anywhere. But now it was dark and everybody had either fallen asleep or at least gone to bed for the night and Naruto had a chance to tell his version of the story without unnecessary comments from the peanut gallery about luring the unwary into his free love hippie commune cult with food, thank you not sigh. And okay, maybe he had missed Kakashi-sensei a little. But just a little, and definitely not the way he was always late to everything. Hey, you were late again. Everything's already over. He pointed and laughed, leaning back on the porch. The Uchiha compound really was eerily quiet and dark at night. The rest of Kanoha always had streetlights and people walking out on the streets, shinobi returning from their night shifts and vendors moving their merchandise when most people were sleeping 
but while the Echiha compound wasn't surrounded by walls it could almost have been its own little village within Kanoha. A ghost village. There was this mayor in the Iron Country that had a really bad spider problem in the town hall and he asked me to sweep the webs away for him Kakashi Sensei explained. He was sitting on the railing by the porch, legs dangling over the side. So what is this I keep hearing about your cult it's not my fault. At first it was just Taiki making an excuse to stay in tea country longer so he could defect and he didn't know I'm a Jinchuriki. Then Miwa Chan heard about it and she got all exited and the last I checked she was making Yandame and Shodame Saints too and making up a lot of profound sounding proverbs and I swear there is no free love involved, period. Naruto was swinging his arms around, flailing about and he noticed that now Kakashi Sensei was looking him straight to the face when he had just been scanning the rooftops. There that intensity was again, the same heavy feeling when he had earlier greeted Sasuke team. Naruto squirmed, trying to come up with something to say again and then the heaviness lifted on its own. Proverbs, huh? How about this it is the spirit that walks a person through darkness, he asked cheerily. Naruto groaned. Kakashi sensei, stop collaborating. She's bad enough as she is. And should you even be encouraging this anyway? It would be just like Kakashi sensei to throw in with the cult idea just so he could watch Tsunade Bachan blame Naruto for the whole thing and do that I laugh thing. Why had he missed the Aero Sensei Jr. anyway? He must have hit his head one time too many when Aero Sensei the first was putting him through dodge training. In darkness all biju are black. The darkness conceals the hippopotamus, Kakashi Sensei went on, unashamed. What those even mean? Naruto moaned. Next you are going to say something about the sound of one hand clapping in the dark. Mean, mean Sensei, making fun of him in his hour of need. See if Kakashi Sensei got any dumplings either, that would teach him. And no ramen for him. Then Kakashi Sensei did something he had never done before in Naruto's hearing. He laughed. It was a very normal sound, but that was why it was actually pretty creepy. It wasn't the usual perverted giggle they heard when Kakashi Sensei got to a dirty joke in his ever present books Naruto could have done without having to know about those damn cheap ass Jiraiya sensei for not getting a real proofreader or the amused half snort when he and Sakura-chan and Sasuke did something stupid. It was a real ha 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 laugh like normal people made and Naruto was struck by the instinct to make no sudden moves, to make calming shushing noises with a mellow tone and back away slowly. So sensei is a saint now? Kakashi sensei mused and shook his head. That's one cult I can get behind of. Shade. In IWA Jiraiya's name was Kenji. His hair was short and dark, his build slim and there was little of his exuberant personality in evidence. If anything Kenji held shades of the studious, serious Orochimaru of those long past days when the Sanin were still young and invincible and all on the same side of the right enough and the totally wrong. A special Akimichi pill had taken care of his build though gaining the muscle mass back afterwards was always a bitch and cutting and re-growing hair was easy, but his best disguise was to shed Jiraiya like a snake would shed its too small skin ah, damn he was being sentimental. Thinking about Naruto and his errant teammate did that to him, but he had little choice right now other than remain in the house he had rented, staring at a wall and thinking. The sleeping beauty currently occupying his bed saw to that. He had happened upon her the night before, on his way back from the secret meeting between Kakuzu and an IWA representative he had witnessed. He had taken a shortcut through an alley between a blacksmith's forge and a shoemaker's shop and almost tripped over the legs of the girl leaning against a dirty wall. She had managed a surprisingly good concealing Jinjutsu considering the condition she was in. His first thought had been that she had picked a foolish place to drink and the second thought had been oh shit. She was pretty enough, Jiraiya supposed, in the girl next door kind of way. Her hair had been dark in the shadows of the alley her lips red with her own blood and her skin white like a woman's who was suffering from severe blood loss. When he had been frozen in indecision just for a second she had opened her eyes and seen Jiraiya. That was fairly shocking. Jiraiya took no pains to deny his many talents what good was sundial in a shade. But one of those talents was to hide his talents, to become one with the shade and become as inconsequential as a mass-produced clay pot. Jiraiya never used Henge or Jinjutsu when infiltrating a hidden village if he could avoid it, never. Only Kanoha had Byakugan, unless those unconfirmed rumors about one Jounin in Kiri turned out to be true, but there were always chakra techniques, Jutsu, hidden seals in all important buildings all ninja had good eyes and a serving of professional paranoia or they were soon dead ninja. 
he would shed muscle mass with a pill, cut and dye his hair and use makeup to carefully cover his tattoos and Sunade Haim said that the time spent in geisha houses was time wasted. It wasn't uncomplicated to make convincing physical changes, but those couldn't be seen through. But the girl hadn't looked at his hair, his skin, his bulk or even the attitude he had projected. She had looked at the bone structure of his face and her eyes had brightened with recognition. Jiraiya had been about to finish her when she had whispered Jiraiya of the Sanin. Good tell Daidara or he'll bad things and promptly fainted after. He had taken her with him and dressed her wounds just for that. Jiraiya had good instincts, but it didn't take a spy genius to figure out that when a woman wearing an IWA headband was found bleeding in an alley, happy to see a Sanin in her village and rambling about the much-speculated Tsuchikij candidate, something was afoot. If only she would wake up so he could get to asking questions she had barely twitched in over twenty hours. Don't you think it's time to wake up, lady? Jiraiya asked her. This was when the sky itself seemed to explode. The boom was huge, like a whole mountain had broken in half. It was more than mere noise the floor trembled under Jiraiya's feet and he could feel the sound at the roots of his teeth. The echoes bounded off the mountain faces and stone walls outside like cracks of thunder. Jiraiya was out of the window and up on the roof in under three seconds and the sight that lit the Awagakir night made his jaw drop. The Tsuchikij's tower had been covered in a cloud of fine stone dust, lit reddish and burnt yellow by the flames consuming it. Who? The tea country was a remote place, but Kiri was aware of Sata Naruto due to Taiki's report now and Orochimaru had lifted his face from his experiments long enough to notice that Kabuto and Sasuke were still missing think about the implications for a second and turn the air blue for half an hour without the aid of a single jutsu. Orochimaru knew about Uzumaki and Jinchiriki, Kiri knew about the cult and the truth was that neither place was spy-free. IWA had several infiltrators in Kiri while Taki and Kumo had managed each to insert a man in Oto not the same man, hilarious though that might have been and Kanoha along with Suna had spies in Kiri, IWA and Kumo respectively and now a lot of important people were asking questions. Who was Sata Naruto? In Kanoha the intelligence people were banging their heads against their desks and wondering just how they were supposed to explain this to their superiors. In Suna the intelligence people were in a tizzy because of the Kazakage's lackadaisical attitude towards whole thing. Just what was he thinking? And what were these people thinking, calling Jinchiriki saints? Maybe it said something about Naruto that in Kanoha that didn't enter the consideration at this point. When the word reached Princess Kazahana Koyuki of the Snow Country she wondered a bit about the surname before concluding that that giving a false name was a ninja thing, that Naruto wasn't that common a name and given the messianic tendencies, what were the chances? There wasn't a pre-existing form for congratulating a person for founding a cult so she got to create one. The people of the Wave Country had no idea what Jinchiriki meant, but it was just like Naruto to protect the world so that was obviously him. And of course other people heard as well. Two of them were of Kanoha and officially dead, one of Kanoha and only officially a traitor. The orphans of the rain that cries with sorrow and the rest of them heard of the man who said the Jinchiriki were saints, heroes, to be revered. They heard the name Naruto and most of them weren't fooled by Satu for a minute. The rest of them would all ask the same question, some befuddled, some amused, some pitying and some just plain scared. The last mentioned were maybe the wisest. Just who was Satu Naruto? Those who knew the name asked the same, but for them who took a bit different connotation. What? The day after the day after, like Naruto counted from the return to the village, Tsubaki had been led out of the Uchiha compound and she was on her way to fulfill a promise. Heads turned after her on the streets and conversations stilled, but now the air was speculating instead of accusing, curious rather than judging. Tsubaki didn't need to hear the half-stifled whispers Danzo and Uchiha and Uzumaki to know what had eclipsed her former relationship with Mizuki in the Kanoha rumor mill. The truth was that all ninja were irrepressible rumor mongers. Intelligence was a matter of life and death and petty gossip made for good dry practice, nosiness was the other occupational disease spread by whisper infection and curiosity killed the cat because Shinobi didn't like competition. So while Tsunade had managed to suppress the exact details of Sasuke's return, Danzo's death and Naruto and Kabuto's role in the thing, it had been beyond even her power to keep the villagers from finding out that the top tier of the village had been upturned and shaken to see what would fall off and now everyone wanted to find out the what. What had Danzo done that Hokage-sama had dueled him in her own office? It hadn't been Hokage-sama, some whispered, but Uzumaki, no, Yakushi. 
Yeah, right, said others, like that weakling could win that fight, and like the traitor would even if he could. And what had Uzumaki done to get Uchiha back, what was he even doing back in the village without Jiraiya and what was Yakushi doing back at all, what, what, what? It was very satisfying, she found out, to have the answers everyone wanted and a good excuse a legitimate order to not tell anyone. Tsubaki preened under the stairs like a cat that had gotten the cream, ambushed the canary and raided the pantry for the good measure. Every stool in Ichiraku was taken when Tsubaki arrived to the small restaurant, but then, she hadn't come to eat. The shinobi eating there weren't quite clumsy enough to fall silent or turn to stare when she pushed the cloth with the kanji for Raku to the side and slipped in, but the men were following her from the corner of their eye. Ichiraku Tuchi stood with his back turned towards her, cooking something that smelled like ginger and prawns and brought water to Tsubaki's tongue, making her reconsider staying for a meal even though it wasn't ten o'clock yet. I am, busy boiling eggs with one hand and frying pork with another, noticed her and gave her a smile. Please wait just a moment, honorable customer, she chirped and pulled the pan from fire. No hurry, I'm just here to have a word with your father, she said, causing Tucci to look over his shoulder. His brow was burrowed when he no doubt tried to remember when he had met her and why she would want to talk with him. Good morning, Tsubaki, the man sitting next to her greeted her. He was a jounin she knew by name, though they hadn't ever been precisely close friends. Good morning, Yoshikazu, she said and smiled like the sun. It was already promising to be a very beautiful day. I haven't seen you for a while, Tsubaki. I take it you just returned from a mission? He fished. You wouldn't see me before I left, Tsubaki thought, but strangely the thought brought her no pain. There was only gleeful anticipation. Oh dear. Naruto really was contagious. Well, yes, my last mission was to the tea country as on field support to Naruto, you see, she drew the moment of revelation on, pausing for a second to have everyone's full, undivided attention. I joined a cult there. A cult? Yoshikazu repeated weakly and more than one man had to collect their jaw from the table. Tsubaki copied one of Kabuto's more beatific smiles the best she could. Yes, we believe in purifying ourselves by obeying the light of truth so that we have sincere love for our brothers and sisters, the power of the human sacrifice that protects us from the evil of the biju, world peace through superior firepower and biodynamic cultivation. Would you like to have a pamphlet? Tsubaki was a good kunoichi and well used to hiding her inner thought. When she looked at the bulging gold fish eyes turned to her it took all she had to not laugh out loud. She could swear her ribs were cracking, keeping it all in. This was when Tucci brought two bowls to the counter and turned towards Tsubaki. He raised one eyebrow in a way that told Tsubaki he didn't believe a word she had just said. Well, those were more like half-truths. Tsubaki wasn't in it for the faith, but she was in for the moral support. She owed Naruto that much at least. So what it was you wanted to talk about, Tsubaki-san? Tucci asked. I came to offer you my most sincere thanks, Tsubaki said and then she struck quickly as a snake. She grabbed Tucci's collar, pulled his upper body over the counter and crushed her mouth against his. Tucci made a small, surprised noise and she took the opportunity to slip him some tongue no sense not going all the way out after all. He tasted like miso and Tsubaki nibbled on his lower lip a final time before releasing him. Thank you for being there for Naruto, she breathed in his ear before straightening. The silence that had fallen could have been cut with a kunai. Have a nice day. She wished the dumbstruck audience and waved a little before traipsing away. Dad, have you joined a cult? Ayam's voice drifted out after her and now Tsubaki snickered out loud. Where? These things always took their time, of course but the initial investigation suggested that Mito Kato Hamura and Yudatane Koharu had been beguiled by Danzo rather than collaborators a fact which made Tsunade very happy. The years had disillusioned them, naturally, but the trust in Danzo and his words and opinion they couldn't fully explain or rationalize when asked some pointed questions had been encouraging just replacing Danzo was going to be a nightmare the man had been traitorous, but he had been a bureaucratically inclined, hard-working traitor and being forced to fully sideline the two elders would make matters that much worse. She would get a new council after the rest of the affairs were in order, of course. No matter how much Hamura and Koharu were innocent and used, keeping them would be to make herself appear weak, and while being forced to retire was a shame, they were old and tired, forced to hold their office for far longer than they should have because the next generation had lacked clearly fitting replacements it was like with Sandame, 
someone who really was too old for the job holding it. He had been physically strong, but more than raw strength was called in the position. Sandame had been tired. Now he had died in the office he had already once retired from. At least Hamura and Koharu would get to die in peace. But while this issue was now out of the way, it still left several more to consider, one of them what to do with the roots remains. There just wasn't place in the system where the kids could be put. Only two men had been taken alive in a fight and they were now entertained by the torture and interrogation, gagged so they couldn't bite their tongue, their chakra seal so they couldn't perform a suicide jutsu and under constant suicide watch. What would be done with them was clear. Sai was the only actual defector and his position was clear enough as well, but the rescued children were a bit of a dilemma. They needed to be deprogrammed and integrated into the proper Kanoha, which was proving to be a particularly complicated matter. They need a proper, home-like environment to acclimate to Kanoha, Hayashi declared. But not by the Hyuga. You are practically a cult, Sum complained and Hishi's face reddened. At least we don't raise our children in a kennel, he sniped back, to which Tsum barked that at least the Inazuka didn't brand their own like cattle. Really, some days Tsunade hoped that the assembly had one, communal neck she could wrap her hand around. After this someone had proposed Naruto and the idea had gotten some reserved support, much to Tsunade's surprise and delight. But the truth was that Kanoha valued results and turning a clearly psychotic Jinchuriki around in mid-invasion had been something that had knocked several socks off even before the boy had proceeded to drag Tsunade back and now do the same to Sasuke and Kabuto. No one really understood Naruto's method, but no one questioned its effectiveness either. What wound up bombing that idea was that Naruto was to leave Kanoha with Jiraiya again right when Tsunade's perverted teammate could be reached. That kind of entourage just wouldn't be practical. What about Yumino Iruka then? Isn't he the one practically raised Naruto? Shikaku asked. The job is too big for one person, but we could assign him some help. This made Tsunade immediately think of Tsubaki and that was just perfect. So Iruka didn't really deserve the headache, but then, he seemed to like dealing with pre gen and Hellions, considering he had refused two Jounin evaluations. They needed a place, now they had two people. That was good enough in her books. When? Hyuga Hinata was twiddling her thumbs as she gazed upon the old Achiha compound. Somewhere there was her Naruto Koen, back in the village as the hero who had brought Sasuke back and done some other things she had heard her father alluding to when he had talked to her grand aunt back in home. She was so happy people could finally see him like she did her heart filled with warm bubbles that felt so real she would have feared any one of her blood could see them, could see her happiness should they simply activate their Byakugan. It would be perfect if she only dared to go into the compound. Well, technically the compound hadn't been declared off-limits, now had it? And she only wanted to learn when she might go there with permission, when she might meet Naruto and how long it would be until he had to leave the village again. Maybe it would be all right if she just quickly snuck in and then out again? Just to get the timetable? The Akugan, she whispered and allowed her chakra to flow through familiar pathways. There were four shapes of adult men and a woman, glowing bright blue with strong reserves and well-exercised pathways, almost illuminated silhouettes seen through the negative of the many walls and trees of the compound, but two of them were on the other side of the compound. Of course, that was where Naruto was as well, along with Sakura, Sasuke, a female jounin she knew by looks though not by name and an unknown man. Naruto was there, his unique chakra tinted with deep buried red so it glowed purple, bubbling like the water of a hot spring, radiating mental energy like a campfire radiated heat in the cold of a winter night. This was why he was so beautiful to her, not because of his golden hair and blue eyes and happy, sunny tan, though that was of course nice as well. It was how he was that much more open than anyone else, how she could see more of him than of other people, right into the, color of taste of burnt orange on ginger, mental component of his chakra because it was just that bright. And open high-level down and hid what they were, but Naruto was open and he was beautiful like a clear jewel that had been cut and polished a bit amateurishly, but that was obviously flawless on the inside. Knowing what he held within and still remained like that simply took Hinata's breath away. She would have to go there and speak in front of everyone, but hadn't she promised to herself she would be braver, just a little braver every day until she was ready. Maybe that day had come now. She walked across the street and slipped through a small opening in the hedgerow between two houses, intent on making her way to Naruto. She had seen two of the umbu watching two separate people, one a young boy, stronger than Hinata was, who was sitting under a tree and drawing something. 
The other was a taller man who looked familiar, though he was a bit too far for Hinata to say who he was, but the way he managed to not give away that much of his chakra despite the Tenketsu being clearly visible suggested a high-level shinobi. Even knowing this she was startled when he stood before her in a flash of chakra and green leaves, his stance much too easy going for the quick reaction. ICA came to timetable Eep. It was Yakushi Kabuto. He had been Orochimaru's spy, what was he doing back in Konoha, in the same place with Naruto? Oh. Oh. Ah, Hinata-san. What might your business here be? He asked. With your Byakugan activated, no less? He inquired gently. Hinata felt flush rising to his cheeks as she deactivated her bloodline hastily. I came, I mean mean, um damn her traitorous tongue for betraying her like this. The umbu she had seen had been hiding behind a corner when she last saw him, watching the meeting surreptitiously. Ah, I see, Hinata-san. I am a medic neen and I see you suffer from a more hurios. Physicians of the Sage of Six Paths time thought of it as a kind of melancholy, brought about by the humorous infection of the middle ventricle of the brain, Kabuto said, his voice smooth and mild like milk. It was a side effect of the Byakugan that the Huga tended to taste what they saw and see sound synesthesia was the medical term. Kabuto's voice was white with almost pearl-like sheen of steel gray around the edges. But why hadn't anyone noticed she was sick? That kind of thing showed in the chakra. The infection is caused by thinking continually on the image of the loved one, Kabuto continued and Hinata's voice was suffocated deep in her throat. The world dimmed in the corners of her vision. Hey! I, I mean, she managed to breathe. This will reach the point where it becomes almost impossible to think of anything else, the silver-haired man continued mercilessly and Hinata fainted dead away. Why? Yumino Irika was humming happily as he penned the requisition forms for a field trip outside of Kanoha his class would take two weeks from now. The forms only needed to be returned three days before the day, but considering the extra paperwork the whole village administration was bound to struggle with and the backlog it was going to create, better safe than sorry. Survival exercises were something that couldn't be substituted within village training. That brought back memories of Naruto. When he had taken that class camping in the forest for a week Naruto had proven that while he might struggle in many subjects, survival wasn't one of them. He had made a fine shelter from fallen branches, moss and vines and when the children were told to catch fish for lunch, Naruto had waded into the river and snatched fish off it bare-handed. Other students had tried to copy the boy, but only gotten wet in the process and Irika thought it had done very good for Naruto's self-esteem. And now his favorite student was back in the village. Irika knew that teachers weren't supposed to have favorites, but he had long since concluded that since Naruto was everyone else's unfavorite, it was just fair that the boy had someone in his corner. And now Naruto was back, with Sasuke no less. Irika's grin widened, but a shadow followed the happiness when he remembered that he hadn't been allowed to meet Naruto yet. It wasn't simply Sasuke, no elder Shimura Danzo had wound up dead thrown off the Hokage's window. And Naruto was somehow connected to this as well. But he didn't worry too much Naruto was all right, Hataki Kakashi had confirmed that much. And he had an informant he was certain he could convince to talk to him Tsubaki-chan. She was back in the village as well and even if she technically shouldn't speak to him, well, he was certain he could covertly guilt trip her into spilling the beans by making careful illusions of friends standing by each other through thick and thin. He was called the nice one in Kanoha and that was true. That didn't mean he didn't know how to get what he wanted when the situation called for it. Back to the little hellions, Suzum sensei groaned and stretched, popping her back in a way that sounded deliciously relieving. Target practice for the next two hours. For you? They were sitting in the teacher's lounge, along with most of the academy sensei poor Hiroshi and Tsunayuki had to take the recess watch and no one envied the two any, as that was almost more draining than two hours of mathematics. In the lounge there was at least sweet, sweet coffee, strong and black scorching hot. In the academy coffee came in three descending stages coffee, medical jutsu and paint remover. Irika took a big gulp from his cup and relished in the revitalizing burn of it as it corroded his esophageal mucosa going down. Free period and after that taijutsu. After that he didn't have time to finish his sentence when the door to the lounge opened and Tsubaki-chan walked in. The first thing he noticed about her was that she looked a lot better than she had when she left for that mission. The spring was back to her steps and the tightness around her eyes was gone now, the upwards curve of her lips replaced by a genuine smile. He had been right. 
Naruto was the best therapy and, despite his voracious appetite, much more affordable than the private sector. There was, of course, the public sector, but that was the TNI ninja moonlighting and even though everybody knew they were on their customer's side in that setting, it's nice to see you, Tsubaki-chan. How have you been? He called out to her. It was impossible to not notice how his fellow teachers cast marginally discreet glances at Tsubaki and the conversations they were carrying became distracted as they strained to hear this and he would have been angry with them, well aware of how the rumors had gotten to her, except her smirk really, really reminded him of Naruto all of a sudden, Naruto just before a smoke bomb went off or the toilets flooded. I'm wonderful, she said and closed the distance between them until she stood practically on his toes. And you are wonderful too. She kissed him. It wasn't a sisterly peck to the cheek like those Irika had previously gotten from her, nor was it the sweet, inquiring, chaste close-mouthed kiss he would have expected from her if he ever considered the possibility of Tsubaki proposing to him. It made his eyes slide close and even then red spots danced in the darkness before them, it made him dizzy, it stole his breath and made his fingertips tingle, it involved a lot of nipping and sucking and it was over much too soon. He only realized Tsubaki had pushed him backwards over his desk when he opened his eyes to look up her. Those red, red lips brushed against his ear thank you for being so good to Naruto. I wish I had been too. With these parting words Tsubaki took to the window. She was out of it before Irika could even summon enough brain power to process her words, let alone get back up. Are you lovers, Irika? Suzum's voice reached an octave Irika hadn't previously known it could. He blushed even redder than he already was, beet red, blood red, when he saw that every soul in the lounge was staring at him. Ah, no, she was just happy? I did something for her? He tried. The eyebrows raised in concert made it clear that the truth had failed to convince anyone. So why was she kissing you then? That didn't look like simple gratitude? Shoichi drawled, winking at him. Could it be just really good afterglow? Please be your speculation to yourself. We are in school building, Irika groused and pressed his face to his hands. He knew that it didn't much matter what he would say now, any comment could only make the matter worse because that hadn't been a thank you kiss. And he would have bet a good amount of money that was precisely why Tsubaki-chan had done it. There was a moment in most ninjas' life those who lived long enough in any rate when they realized that it didn't and shouldn't matter what complete strangers thought of them because life was short and their kind lived hard and fast and probably wouldn't leave a very pretty body behind. What did it matter that some people thought academy teachers weren't real shinobi if that was what you wanted to do with your life? So what if green spandex and the flames of youth made the passer by cringe or Irika admitted this only very reluctantly reading porn in public was supposed to be mortifying? Sticks and stones could break the bones of someone really bad at dodging, but if you actually got your bones broken for a living, words suddenly seemed a lot less daunting. Naruto had learned this much sooner than anyone should and it seemed that he had taught the lesson to Tsubaki-chan who was now reveling in the novelty of the freedom it gave her. Good for her well, she was sent out to assist Naruto and they came back with Sasuke, and isn't Irika practically Naruto's dad anyway? Maybe they conspired together to give her a chance to kill the bastard who turned Mizuki? Two bird with one stone and all. But didn't Kabuto come back to the village alive? Do you think Mizuki might have suffered a sad accident in the prison? His colleagues were going to try to hit the why of the curious case of the sensei and the hot kiss for the next month at the very least and everyone was going to ask him questions when he had lesson plans to make or quizzes to grade. It was going to be a really long month. How? That evening saw Naruto happily bouncing up the stairs to Irika's floor in the old apartment building. Tsune Bachan had finally let them out of quarantine and he had been already in the village for ages without seeing his old teacher. He didn't want Irika sensei to think he didn't respect him anymore now that Aero sensei had taken over. Maybe Irika sensei didn't know the really cool stuff, but he had at least taught Naruto consistently seven hours a day and five days a week even when he had to chase Naruto down and drag him to the academy in ropes. Not that Naruto had made him do that more often than once a year once he realized that Irika sensei really cared and it wasn't nice to evade him. He paused a bit before knocking on the door thinking that maybe he should have brought Sasuke with him because Irika sensei had to be worried for him. Irika sensei was like that, he worried for everyone and especially everybody he had ever taught. When you leave the academy your ass belong to the village, but your well-being is Irika sensei's, he had once tried to explain it to Sakura-chan. Don't say such crude things. Sakura-chan had shouted and thrown him with a sandal. 
They had this problem where they spoke with each other and had two different conversations. But maybe Sakura-chan had understood after all because every time she sprained a wrist or an ankle in a school spar she went to Irika-sensei after the practice without complaining about being all right at all and allowed herself be properly fussed over. That girl called Ami or something had called Sakura-chan a teacher's pet, but then Ino had kicked Ami's ass to the curb in the next spar they had and Ami got fussed at instead. Irika-sensei, I'm back. He shouted and knocked to the door. He actually had a key as well Irika-sensei had given it to him after the seventeenth time he had tried to break in and got tangled in his rope traps instead but he had also said that it was really impolite to just march into other people's homes without knocking if they were inside. Naruto had tried to break in to prank his sensei and he had practically squirmed with shame when Irika-sensei had smiled and told him he trusted Naruto with the key. He had never pranked Irika-sensei in his home after all, but kept that stuff in school wait a minute. Naruto, it's good to see you too, but you don't need to drop my paintings off the wall when you knock, Irika-sensei chided him gently as he opened the door. He looked a bit harried for some reason not Naruto harried, that look was closer to exasperated and fond that strained Irika-sensei, what's happened to you? Naruto asked and then shook his head. Wait, that wasn't what I was going to ask. I mean, I want that answer too, but when you gave me the key it was a bringing me up right thing, wasn't it? He punctuated his outrage with a poke to Irika-sensei's chest. It took you this long to notice you came here to ask me that? Irika-sensei blinked. No, that wasn't why I came either. Can we go to Ichiraku together? I have a lot to tell you. He made his best puppy dog eyes at his sensei. Was this really the reason or will you remember something else you came here for? Irika-sensei asked him and Naruto pouted. Now you are teasing me. It isn't fair, he complained. I can't help myself, you know. But I haven't pranked anyone since Jiraiya-sensei left me in Makamura. I have been a responsible adult forever and a day. To be young enough for forever and a day to still happen, Irika-sensei said inexplicably, but he ruffled Naruto's hair and Naruto hummed deep in his throat, his eyes closing. Irika-sensei had looked proud. That made Naruto want to squirm out of his skin out of sheer joy, in a good kind of way if that made any sense. To answer your questions in order of inquiry, I have suddenly become a gossip item, yes, I tricked you into behaving more maturely by showing you I trust you that's called bringing you up. And we can go to Ichiraku, but maybe we should talk here inside instead. Much of what has happened is sensitive information after all. Now Irika-sensei gave him a stern look as something occurred to him. I have the clearance to know about everything you are going to tell me, right? Even about Danzo falling out of Hokage's window? Naruto rubbed his head and smiled a little. Eh heh, I kind of haven't asked. Wait a second, Danzo's fallen out of a window who is Danzo? He tried, hurriedly, since he probably shouldn't tell Kabuto and Sai's secrets. He was going to tell all his own, but Kabuto and Sai should decide about that he so could be mature. And Irika shook his head, snorting. Only you, Naruto, only you. And I would like to know how this all came to be. I have questions as well and a lot more than you, I presume. But he ruffled Naruto's hair again and all was well in the world. If. At first Kabuto was surprised when the Kanoha assembly informed him that after the initial debriefing was over a polite way to call comparatively polite interrogation he was to follow Naruto back to Makamura. He would have thought that he would be kept under very, very close watch for the foreseeable future, the next ten years or so and this made him very suspicious of the assembly's motives. He knew that however much faith Godame Hokage might have in Naruto, the rest of the lot was as trusting as Ocean was dry as allowing him out of the village mere days after the fact screamed set up loud and clear. These days his mind was collected and uncluttered, undisturbed like a frozen lake, as clear and hard and cold as ice. He was already running calculations in his mind. We expect you will tow the line very carefully, Yakushi-san, Yamanaka Inoichi spoke to him. Kabuto took care to keep his body language submissive, respectful and non-threatening. He smiled what he called his omote smile. Like the no masks, it was properly upwards curled and blank, allowing the watcher to read and think what they would, revealing nothing. Do not betray us. Oh. So this was the gambit they played. Senju Tsunade's face was pleasant and inscrutable. I will not make you regret your mercy, he said in the comfortable certainty that the powerful men and women in front of him were already regretting it. 
Of course they weren't simply letting him out of the village with Naruto-sama and whichever superior officer had the orders to visibly accompany him to Makamura not Tsubaki, most likely, given her demonstrated indulgence of Naruto-sama. An umbu team or maybe several would follow them surreptitiously to see if Kabuto would hang himself with the rope he was given. He was very certain every soul in the council chamber was praying to whatever higher power they might believe in that he would. They had all known Shimura Danzo after all. Clearly not as well as they had believed, but enough to be uncomfortably aware that the man had to have been in possession of several skeletons in the clan closets and Kabuto had already demonstrated how much of Danzo's affairs he knew. Naruto-sama would not suffer for Kabuto to be killed or imprisoned and Tsunade would not suffer for Naruto-sama to be betrayed so this was the best they could do to give him a chance to desert, to meet foreign agents in secrets, to do anything that could be used as an excuse. Inuzuku Tsum's face was stormy and her eyes glittered like sharp shards of flint and Kabuto knew she had been against this, that she was much too straightforward and honest to keep any dark secrets. Scarred Nara Shikaku appeared more annoyed than anything and Kabuto wondered if his disinclination to under-the-table deals was because it would have been illogical to indulge in them or simply a matter of laziness. But the rest of them, they all had faces like windows with the shutters closed on the inside. What shameful secrets could Yakushi Kabuto reveal? What if, given how thorough and eager he had been to part with his information so far, he chose to do so in the in-depth interrogation? What measures would official Kanoha be forced to take? Or what if, gods forbid, he should talk to Naruto? The young Jinchiriki had already forced the Hokage to confront a situation that had left the village's unofficial, but also undisputed second most powerful man dead in its wake. I will die Naruto-samas, he said and it was as much a threat as it was a promise. Kanoha hadn't been very kind to Naruto-sama so far and best indication of future behavior was the past behavior. If Naruto-sama ever needed an edge, some weapon to use against those he wasn't allowed to raise his hand against? Steel broke and chakra ran low, but good blackmail was forever. And Naruto was walking to the gates of Kanoha with his team. He was so happy Sakura-chan had decided to come see him off and it was kind of nice for Sasuke to have joined them too, he guessed. He wasn't really sure what was up with Kakashi-sensei since he was actually on time for the first time since Naruto first met him, but at least he was still walking with that perverted book stuck to his face. If he had left that behind Naruto would have suspected a new invasion or something. Kakashi-sensei without porn was like Tsunade Bachan winning at gambling. I'm happy they let Kabuto come, but why can't they send Tsubaki-chan too? She's great, he asked, not from anyone particular. Tsunade Bachan had said that she was needed because the assembly hoped she had learned some tricks from him and that was kind of awesome, but what was he going to do without her? Tsubaki-chan was kind of like Sakura-chan's older sister who mothered the team and was always there when someone needed her. And maybe, just maybe, Naruto had wondered at times if having Tsubaki-chan was like a having a big sister of his own, or mother, except she was too much of a friend to be mother. It was difficult to put in words what Tsubaki-chan was to him, but leaving her behind was going to suck. Take care of yourself and take care of Kabuto, Sakura-chan admonished him. He promised to teach me some tricks. This made Kakashi-sensei stumble for some reason, but Naruto nodded and promised that yes, he would be fine and so would Kabuto. He never let his friends down. And you would better not make Sakura-chan cry again, he told Sasuke and flicked a finger at his nose. Sasuke's face was a picture of pure disbelief, but there was something else there too, something that Naruto had already learned to label as Itachi. He almost apologized, but then Sasuke snorted and called him an idiot and all was right in the world again. The clouds were hanging low, heavy and wet above Kanoha as they reached the gates. Kabuto was waiting there and Tsubaki-chan and Taiki stood by him, holding a folded red umbrella under her arm. For a moment Naruto hoped that she was coming as well, but she didn't have any bags with her at all still, it was good enough that she had come to see him off as well. Naruto bounced to her and grinned. Try to look after Sasuke too, okay? He really needs it, he confided in her. Sasuke threw a punch at him, but he dodged it easily, and it wasn't like Sasuke was really all that angry since he didn't punch again. I will see what I can do. Even though my list of people to look after she muttered under her breath, but brightened then. Irika asked me to tell you he's sorry he couldn't come, but he has a class in session right now. It was one of the good goodbyes. The last time Naruto had left Kanoha he had grinned and borne it, 
but the truth was that Sasuke had run off to join Orochimaru and he had been unable to fulfill his promise to Sakura-chan and while he hadn't given up at all, he had felt like he was trying to pull the weight of all Kanoha up a hill, in rain and knee-high mud. He had been happy and optimistic because if he hadn't been so he would have cried. Now Sasuke was back in Kanoha and Sakura-chan's pretty smiles were even prettier because they were a hundred percent genuine, Danzo had been toppled and Kabuto was back and he was leaving the whole circus in good hands. Of course it was too good to just remain so. There was always an and in Naruto's life. Some people insisted that there was a but in theirs. My job is fun and interesting, but the pay is small. She's really fun and pretty, but her parents are terrifying and have a lot of exploding tags. Naruto didn't believe in that sort of wimpy defeatist attitude and so he had ends instead. Sasuke ran away and I'm going to train with Jiraiya Sensei, it can be fixed. Suna attacked us and I kicked Gara's ass, now he's better and I don't have to wonder if I could have ended up like that. He was a great believer in Anne's. Greetings, my eternal rival. It is my honor to inform you that I have been chosen to accompany your most youthful protege to the youthful town of Makamura and I promise to do my absolute best to protect him from all the evils in the world. Naruto froze and turned to face Mado Guy in his green spandex glory, followed by Rock Lee who made a good guy pose and joined his sensei's declarations of protection and eternal friendly rivalry, long-suffering Tenten and even more long-suffering Niji. So so he was going to travel with the youthful duo and he was going to return to Makamura. And surely Miwa-chan could bowl even them over with her ardent momentum. And then it started to rain. He. It was Doi Hurataiki's fourth day in Kanahagakur and he had a theory about his new compatriots. He called it the conservation of shinobi sanity the more there were shinobi, the less there was sanity per person. This alone wasn't anything that hadn't applied in Kirigakur as well though the crazy had been of more bloody quality but he had then added a subclause about the effects of active engineering for ideology's sake versus passive acceptance because the senju apparently used to have pretty damn odd sense of humor. In other words just how we lost the last, three, wars to these? Of course, for him these and us had switched now, or rather, he had switched. He would better remember to think of himself as Conahan, but still, as a new defector he had been assigned in village low security courier duty for the next six months. Carrying a few scrolls per day was just a formality that justified his wages during the parole when the village couldn't send him out and couldn't trust him with any sensitive information patience or training impressionable children and as a result he was left with a lot of time to train and make friends with his former enemies in theory at least. As it turned out, the latter was much less time consuming than he had assumed. Hey, you there! The dry one with the long nose. A voice sounded a little ways from behind him. Taiki turned around, swallowing the flash of indignant irritation at the comment about his nose so it was just a bit long, it wasn't a crane's beak or anything. But he was new in the village and he had already resigned himself to some hazing now that Naruto had left the village. It was raining again and the woman walking briskly towards him was holding up an orange umbrella. She wore her middle-length hair up on a ponytail and her coat open and under that coat Taiki snapped his gaze up and hoped his smile wasn't as frozen as it felt. He had never met her before, but he recognized her from the picture in the Kiri Bingo book. She was Mitarashi Enko, one-time student of the infamous Orochimaru of the Sanin. He had no need to summon the notes and recommendations section of her page to his mind it came easily, at its own behest. When offended, Mitarashi exhibits signs of a mixed state, a condition during which symptoms of mania and depression occur simultaneously, manifesting in her case as predisposition to frustration and fits of rage. How can I help you? He asked with even voice and distributed his weight in a little more advantageous way. He wondered if she wore her coat open like that to get an excuse to attack people. That was your last scroll today, wasn't it? Great, I'm Mitarashi Enko and I'm taking you to the ninja mouse for the traditional meet, greed and make sure we never killed one another's loved ones session, come. She didn't give Taiki time to figure out what that meant or ask if she had been stalking him, but grabbed his left arm and started dragging him down the street. The ninja mouse turned out to be a small and apparently very popular bar. The tables, Taiki notes, were all taken and the seating by the bar were all taken as well but Mitarashi didn't let this stop herself. She simply strong-armed her way into a table with three other occupants. A man with green bandana tied around his head and a sinbon in his mouth nodded to them. The other man, 
a much harsher looking individual with bandana and an eye patch barely spared Taiki a glance and continued talking to a beautiful but stern looking woman whose hair was a spectacular shade of dark that bordered on purple. Hey guys, this is Doihara Taiki, Taiki, these are Shiranui Gunma, Akei Maiwana, and Yuzuki Yugogo, Anko made the introductions. It's nice to meet you, the one named Shiranui Gunma said politely and Taiki greeted him in return. Why don't you just electrocute the pests? Yugogo asked Iwana. And let them die and rot inside the air ducts? Have you got any idea how bad the smell would get? Iwana snapped, but Yugogo didn't seem taken aback at all. The archives appear to have a bit of a pest problem. This rain has driven snakes inside and they have taken refuge in the ducts, Gunma explained the situation amicably with a stage whisper while Anko hollered for sake. This was when a dark-haired young man entered the bar with a loud bang as the door hit the wall, making several people jump and turn to look, their hands not so discreetly at their weapons. The man paid the turn he had caused no mind, but marched to their table. Anko, I need you at the TNI, the man said without preamble. This made Anko visibly perk up. Great, can I be the meaner one? What's my story? She asked and stood up, stretching her back in a very distracting way. What you mean, your story? The so far nameless man appeared confused. Taiki had always been the silent watcher at the edges of any crowd he had been part of and he felt sliding into that comfortable niche again. It almost made this situation seem homely. I need a story so I can be properly menacing. Remember that course we were given about method acting? Did he kill my little brother, for example? She asked. You actually took that drivel seriously? Ginma asked and Enko made a rude gesture to him. You have a little brother? The TNI shinobi asked, not looking convinced. I can't take mongoose and they don't have the security clearance, I wanna inexplicably stated. It took Taiki a second to realize he was engaged in another conversation entirely. I must have had one if that bastard killed him, Anko snarled, honest to God snarled. Neither have the snakes, Yugugo pointed out with a very reasonable voice. So this was the village that had bred and raised Uzumaki Naruto. It made a lot more sense than Taiki had thought possible just a day ago. Yet somehow this wasn't an entirely bad thing. He had already learned how too much normalcy could kill the soul. She. It was the first day after Naruto had departed from the village with Meido Guy and his team. Deciding who would go with him had been a difficult decision to make, Tsubaki knew. Hitaki Kakashi would have been the natural choice, being Naruto's Jounin sensei, but he was also Sasuke's sensei and the Uchiha needed him inarguably more at the moment. Due to the inherent risks of Naruto being a genin jinchiriki out of his village, the unfortunately widespread reputation he had recently gained and no one trusting Kabuto as far as they could throw the Hokage monument, the council had wanted to appoint one of the strongest jounin to watch Naruto's back. Tsubaki was more than a little surprised that they let Naruto return to Makamura at all, but undoubtedly they had their reasons or Tsunade-sama had finally had it with the bickering and locked the lot of them into a closet with Naruto for an hour. That would explain it as well. Naruto's charisma approached reality warping on occasion. The first candidate had been Sarutobi Asuma, but Tsunade-sama had vetoed that, explaining that the man was needed in Kanoha to take over some of Danzo's previous duties. Anko had been proposed and the proposal hastily retracted after the person mentioning her had some time to think things through. Anko and Kabuto in the same team? Gods forbid how that might have ended, two of Orochimaru's former students in the same team and backing up Naruto. Kurinai's name had been mentioned as well, but in the end Hyuga Hayashi didn't want to lay his precious, delicate daughter open to Kabuto's influence, leaving Meido Guy the one appointed. Apparently Niji was much sturdier than Hinata. Tsubaki would have pitted Naruto, but she pitted herself enough she wasn't certain which of them had it worse at the moment. She watched the children standing in parade rest in the middle of the training field. They all still wore similar clothes, but she and Irika sensei had purchased a few different accessories, bandanas and leg warmers and such, to give the children a taste of individuality. The children still didn't seem to know what to think of that. They were difficult to read in general, but if she had to make a guess, she would have called their current mood entirely unapologetic. The first of the day's exercise had been to walk them here through the village, at walking speed, to see how they would interact with normal people. At first they hadn't spoken with anyone at all, hadn't looked anyone into the eye and greeted, touched, expressed any kind of curiosity. 
Then Irika sensei had told them the purpose of the exercise was to learn human interaction. Now, what have we learned from today's experience? Yuki-chan? She had been the one to name her. Roughly half of the children had lacked even names prior to being liberated. Naruto had told her how Danzo had died and it was her opinion it had been entirely too easy. It was enough to make her forgive the children, really, but still. A cute, black-haired girl child walking up to an old woman standing in front of a grocery stand, feeling the tomatoes. A cute, innocent-looking girl with hidden weapons walking up to an old woman walking down the street. Tomatoes are like people they shouldn't bruise too easily. Good day, ma'am. I hope you are feeling well today. Old people die and you don't look very good Yuki-chan tilted her head with a movement more like a snake's than a bird's. She still made it look adorable. People don't appreciate honesty or unasked opinions, she said eventually. Butter wouldn't have melted in her mouth. And how about you, Tamaki Kuen? Irika sensei asked with a voice that completely bypassed the part of Tsubaki's mind where thought and deliberation dwelt and struck at the primal, instinctive obedience instead. She found herself standing in parade rest and blinked in shock. A tap on superior officer's shoulder is not an attack and even if it was, he can defend himself from his student's civilian parents, the boy with red bracers whom Irika had named parroted meekly. This is going to be a long year, Tsubaki sensei. Of evening classes, no less, Irika sensei muttered and Tsubaki winced as she remembered that he still had to teach his regular student as well. She thought that until everything was over she was going to either fall into a bed with him bonding over shared trauma and life-threatening situations or kill him to end his misery. The latter might have been more merciful, but she wasn't that merciful kind of girl. And that teacher voice of his was really unfairly hot.